2022. In his first pre-election budget three years ago, the Treasurer Josh Frydenberg crowed that Australia was back in the black, how times have changed. Now the country has record debt accumulated during the COVID period. The massive spend achieved the goal of keeping the economy in good shape and unemployment down, but now voters are feeling the pinch from the rising cost of living. And with the Prime Minister under pressure, this budget is seen as crucial to the coalition's re-election chances. Shortly we'll have more on what the budget means for you, but first here's Australia's Treasurer. I've received a message from His Excellency, the Governor-General, recommending in accordance with Section 56 of the Constitution an appropriation for the purposes of the Appropriation Bill No. 1 of 2022-2023, and I call the Treasurer. I present the Appropriation Bill No. 1 2022-23 and the explanatory memorandum. A bill for an act to appropriate money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the ordinary annual services of the government and for related purposes. The Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Tonight, as we gather, war rages in Europe. The global pandemic is not over. Devastating floods have battered our communities. We live in uncertain times. The last two years have been tough for our country. There have been setbacks along the way. But Australia remains resilient. Australia remains strong. We have overcome the biggest economic shock since the Great Depression. Our recovery leads the world. Faster and stronger than the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Italy, Canada and Japan. Mr Speaker, those opposite said the biggest test for our government would be what happens to jobs. Tonight, I confirm to the House, unemployment is at 4 per cent, the equal lowest in 48 years. Yeah. There are now nearly 2 million Australians more in work today than when we came to government. More women in work than ever before. Yeah. And this budget will see unemployment go even lower, delivering more jobs and higher wages. This is not luck. Our economic plan is working. JobKeeper saved 700,000 jobs. HomeBuilder helped more than 100,000 people into a home. Taxes are lower for more than 11 million Australians and 3.6 million small businesses and sole traders our AAA credit rating has been maintained. Mr Speaker, this is our record. Mr Speaker, a strong economy means a stronger budget. And this is what we deliver tonight. The largest and fastest improvement to the budget bottom line in over 70 years. By the end of the forward estimates, the budget is $100 billion better off compared to last year. More people in work and fewer on welfare. Repairing the budget without increasing taxes. The deficit for 22-23 is expected to be $78 billion or 3.4 per cent of GDP. 
Over the next three years, this will more than halve to 1.6 per cent. Net debt as a share of our economy will peak at 33.1 per cent at the 30th of June 2026, significantly lower than what was forecast last year. We have drawn clear lines, banking the dividend of a stronger economy, ending economy-wide emergency support. When we did so, those opposite were quick to criticise. When Labor starts spending, they simply don't stop, and the result is higher taxes and higher interest rates. Only the coalition can responsibly manage the budget and strengthen our nation's finances. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, our thoughts tonight are with those who have lost loved ones, homes and businesses in the catastrophic floods across New South Wales and South East Queensland. Nothing I say can overcome the personal pain and loss so many Australians have felt. We will stand with these communities and help them rebuild. Already over one million disaster payments have been made. Total support to families, farmers, small businesses, local governments and their communities is expected to exceed $6 billion. It will deliver hope, work and the prospect of returning to a better life. Mr Speaker, tonight we look to the future, realistic about the growing threats we face, ambitious for our country and our children, optimistic about what can be achieved. As we emerge from the pandemic, we are building an even stronger, more secure and confident Australia where aspiration and enterprise are encouraged and rewarded, where families have greater flexibility and choice, where those in need get a helping hand, where greater self-reliance leaves our nation less vulnerable to threats, where our modern competitive industries create new jobs, where Australia and our allies protect the national interest. This is our vision for Australia, and this is what tonight's budget delivers. Cost of living relief now, a long-term economic plan that creates more jobs, record investments in essential services, stronger defence and national security, a plan for the times. Mr Speaker, events abroad are pushing up the cost of living at home. Higher fuel, food and shipping costs are increasing inflation and stretching household budgets. Tonight, the Morrison government announces a new temporary targeted and responsible cost of living package to ease these pressures. Practical measures that will make a difference. Fuel excise will be cut in half. For the next six months, Australians will save 22 cents a litre every time they fill up. A family with two cars who fill up once a week could save $30 a week or around $700 over the next six months. Whether you're dropping the kids at school, driving to and from work, visiting family and friends, it will cost less. This cut in fuel excise, which takes effect from midnight tonight, will flow through to the Bowser over the next two weeks. The competition watchdog will monitor retailers to make sure that these sa savings are passed on in full. This temporary reduction in fuel excise will not come at the cost to road funding which will see more than $12 billion spent in the coming year. Yeah. Mr Speaker, tonight 
I also announce a new one-off $420 cost of living tax offset for more than 10 million low and middle income earners. Individuals already receiving the low and middle income tax offset will now receive up to $1,500 and couples up to $3,000 from the 1st of July this year. This measure comes on top of the $40 billion in tax relief already provided by our government since the start of the pandemic. Under the coalition, taxes for hard-working Australians will always be lower. Mr Speaker, Tonight, I also announce a new one-off $250 cost of living payment delivered within weeks to 6 million Australians. Yeah. Pensioners, carers, veterans, job seekers, eligible self-funded retirees and concession card holders will benefit. Together with ind existing indexation arrangements, this will see a single pensioner receive more than $500 in additional support over the next six months, just when they need it at most. Mr Speaker, to provide further cost of living relief tonight, I also announce greater access to medicines for 2.4 million Australians. For many Australians, incurring these costs is not negotiable. Australians will need fewer scripts before they are eligible for free or further discounted medicines. Mm -hmm. This budget's new cost of living package is responsible and targeted, delivering cheaper fuel, cheaper medicines and putting more money into the pockets of hard-working Australians. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, tonight we write a new chapter in Australia's economic story with a plan that backs Australians, their enterprise and their aspirations. Mr Speaker, Australia's unemployment rate is heading towards a 50-year low. We have a historic opportunity to get young Australians into skilled, secured and well-paid jobs. The dignity of work is important to all Australians. During this pandemic, we have already invested $13 billion in skills and training. With a record 220,000 Australians now in a trade apprenticeship, the highest level since records began back in 1963. Tonight we go further with a $2.8 billion investment to increase the take-up and completion rate for apprentices, providing $5,000 payments to new apprentices and up to $15,000 in wage subsidies for employers who take them on. Mr Speaker, in this budget, we also lay the foundations for national skills reform with a $3.7 billion investment, supporting an additional 800,000 training places, ensuring businesses get the skilled workers they need. Tonight, we also fund new and expanded programs to help find employment for disadvantaged youth, Indigenous Australians the mature aged and Australians with a disability. Skilling Australians is part of our plan for a stronger future. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, small and family businesses are at the heart of our economy and our local communities. They employ nearly 8 million Australians. The government has backed small businesses with the lowest tax rates in 50 years and record investment incentives. Tonight we go further, rewarding small businesses that invest in skills and new technology. No one knows better than a small business owner what skills they need in their employees. Starting tonight, 
For every $100 a small business spends on training their employees, they will get a $120 tax deduction, yeah. helping them become more productive and competitive. In this budget, we're also backing small businesses that are embracing the digital revolution. From tonight, every $100 these small businesses spend on digital economy technologies like cloud computing, e-invoicing, cybersecurity and web design, they will get a $120 tax deduction. Yeah. Investments of up to $100,000 per year will be supported by this new measure. Mr Speaker, lower taxes for small business is part of our plan for a stronger future. Mr Speaker, COVID and events in Ukraine have been a powerful reminder that we must increase our self-reliance. Australia has a world-class manufacturing sector. Tonight we announce new funding to solve for vulnerabilities in our supply chains. New funding to make Victoria the first place in the Southern Hemisphere to manufacture mRNA vaccines. New funding to drive collaboration between our universities, CSIRO and industry to rapidly commercialise new technologies in clean energy, medical supplies, defence and other high priority areas. And a new patent box for the agriculture and low emissions technology sectors. This will see income from new patents developed in Australia taxed at almost half the rate that applies to large companies. A, more, a modern, resilient manufacturing sector is part of our plan for a stronger future. Mr Speaker, our regions will always be an economic powerhouse generating prosperity for our nation. Yeah, yeah. No government has invested more in our regions than this Liberal National Coalition. Yeah, yeah. And tonight we go further, announcing an unprecedented regional investment package that includes transformational investments in agriculture, infrastructure and energy, in the Hunter, the Pilbara, the Northern Territory and North and Central Queensland. Yeah. These long-term investments will unlock new economic frontiers and grow our national economy. Yeah. Mr Speaker, our regional package also includes major new investments in water projects a new regional accelerator, telecommunications and health. A new $7.4 billion investment in more dams and water projects to improve vital water security and expand irrigation. Yeah. A new $2 billion regional accelerator program to invest in skills, education infrastructure, export market development and supply chain resilience for our regions. A new $1.3 billion telecommunications package to expand mobile coverage across 8,000 kilometres of regional transport routes. Yeah. More training places for doctors at regional universities. Yeah. Better access to MRI machines, mental health services and childcare centres across regional and remote Australia. Yeah. Stronger regions will always be part of the coalition's plan for a stronger future. Yeah. Mr Speaker, our record $120 billion infrastructure pipeline has already completed over 35,000 projects across the country since we came to government. Nation building projects like the Melbourne to Brisbane inland rail, the new Western Sydney International Airport, and Snowy 2.0 are well underway. Tonight's budget includes new commitments to road and rail projects, 
Brisbane to Sunshine Coast, faster rail. Sydney to Newcastle, faster rail. The Metronet project in Western Australia. The North-South Corridor in South Australia. Great Eastern Drive in Tasmania. Central Australian tourism roads in the Northern Territory. Melbourne intermodal terminals to increase the efficiency of the national freight network. More than $500 million is in this budget for local councils to deliver priority projects and $880 million to better connect regional Australia with ports, airports and other transport hubs. <clears throat> Delivering our record infrastructure pipeline is a vital plan for a stronger future. Mr Speaker, Australia is on the pathway to net zero emissions by 2050 and playing its part in responding to the critical global challenge of climate change. Technology, not taxes, will get us there. Here, here. Already, Australia has the highest uptake of rooftop solar in the world, and we're investing in clean hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, batteries and large-scale solar. Tonight, we make further investments in microgrids to support regional and remote communities that don't otherwise have access to the grid with small-scale renewable energy projects like solar and wind. A low emissions future with reliable and affordable power is critical to our plan for a stronger economy. Yeah. Mr Speaker, a strong economy enables us to guarantee the essential services that Australians rely on. Our government has delivered record funding for schools, for hospitals, Medicare, mental health, aged care, women's safety and disability support. Funding for our health system has increased every year under our government and is now at a record high. <laughs> Medicare is guaranteed. Bulk billing rates are at a record high. We have approved more than 2,800 new or amended listings on the PBS. That is nearly one every day. Tonight, I announce the listing of Trevelvi for a rare form of breast cancer, saving patients up to $80,000 per treatment. For the first time, this drug gives hope to many young women, extending their life expectancy and providing an opportunity to spend precious time with their loved ones. Like Alison, a young mum who, when she got her terminal prognosis, wrote a letter to her daughter, Matilda, to open on her 12th birthday when Alison would no longer be there. Because of Trevelvi, Alison will tomorrow celebrate Matilda's 12th birthday. Yeah. And both Alison and Matilda are both in the chamber with us tonight. Mr Speaker, we also continue to invest in keeping Australians safe from the pandemic. With vaccines, testing and treatment and more PPE to boost the national stockpile ahead of winter. Mr Speaker, as we all in this chamber know, mental illness can be completely debilitating for patients and their families. Too many young Australians are living lives of quiet desperation. Last year's budget saw a landmark $2.3 billion investment in mental health and suicide prevention. And tonight we build on that commitment. In this budget, more, there are more headspace services, community-based treatment centres and digital mental health support. Combating suicide 
is a national priority and no government has invested more in mental health services. Mm -hmm. Mr Speaker, one in four women are subject to domestic violence and tragically every 11 days an Australian woman loses her life at the hands of her current or former partner. In last year's budget, we committed $1.1 billion for prevention, early intervention, response and recovery programs. And tonight we go further with a new $1.3 billion package to end violence against women and children. More frontline services, emergency accommodation and support to access legal and health services for women and children in need. This budget also includes a substantial new women's health package, stillbirth and miscarriage support, the establishment of new endometriosis clinics, greater access to breast and cervical cancer screenings, all of which are in tonight's budget. Mr Speaker, employment is critical to economic security. Under the coalition, female workforce participation is at a record high and female unemployment is at its lowest level since 1974. Yeah. But there is more to do. And tonight I announce significant changes to enhance paid parental leave. Families, not governments, are best placed to decide what works for them. Yeah. We will expand the eligibility and provide working families with full flexibility and greater choice. More families will be able to access 20 weeks of leave and decide how they share it. For the first time, single parents will now be able to access the full 20 weeks. The 180,000 new parents who access paid parental leave each year will benefit from these changes. This budget, with more than $2 billion of measures to improve the safety, health and economic security of women, is part of our plan for a stronger future. Mr Speaker, when we came to government, federal funding for disability support was half of what it is today. The NDIS has changed the lives of 500,000 Australians and their families. In this budget, NDIS funding grows in every year, and under the coalition, the NDIS will always be fully funded. Yeah. Mr Speaker, since we came to government, funding for aged care has doubled. In last year's budget, I outlined a new five-year, $17.7 billion plan for the sector with new home care packages, respite services, training places, retention bonuses and infrastructure upgrades. Under this plan, 40,000 home care packages, 34,000 additional training places, 7,000 new personal care workers and 8,400 respite services will be rolled out this calendar year. This budget provides more than $340 million in new funding to embed pharmacy services within residential aged care facilities to improve medical medication management for the elderly. Mm -hmm. Mr Speaker, home ownership is fundamental to the coalition. Yeah. Home Builder, the First Home Super Saver Scheme yeah. and the Home Guarantee Scheme have helped make the dream of home ownership a reality. Over the last year, 160,000 Australians have purchased their first home. And tonight we go further, more than doubling the Home Guarantee Scheme to 50,000 places per year, helping more single parents to buy a home with a deposit as low as 2 per cent, helping more first home buyers buy a home with a deposit as low as 5 per cent, 
And in this budget, we're also increasing our support for affordable housing by $2 billion through the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. Helping more Australians to own a home is part of our plan for a stronger future. Yeah. Mr Speaker, our government will provide more than $180 billion in education funding over the next four years. Record funding for preschools, record funding for schools, more than 30,000 new places at universities last year, and in tonight's budget, we continue to invest in these critical areas. New regional scholarship programs to support students from lower socioeconomic families and new funding for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander student boarding program. Mm. Mr Speaker, our government is safeguarding Australia's unique environment for future generations. For thousands of years, our First Nations people have cared for country. Tonight, we are investing a further $636 million to expand the Indigenous Rangers program with more than 1,000 new rangers to undertake land and sea management. Yeah, yeah. An additional $1 billion in world-leading marine science to protect the Great Barrier Reef. More than $800 million to enhance our scientific capability in the Antarctic, funding vital research and environmental management. More than $170 million for threatened species and habitat restoration, including for our koalas. And we're also continuing to invest in ways to reduce waste through our Recycling Modernisation Fund, saving 10 million tonnes of recyclables from landfill every year by 2030. No longer are we exporting waste. We are recycling it here at home and creating 10,000 jobs in the process. Yeah. Mr Speaker, our economic plan can only be achieved if our nation is strong and secure. Our veterans have given so much in the service of our country. Our nation owes them eternal gratitude. In this budget, we provide further funding to support home care services for 37,000 veterans and their families, as well as extending other programs supporting the wellbeing and the mental health of our veterans. Mm -hmm. The lesson of history is that weakness invites aggression. It leaves nations vulnerable to coercion. This is the reality we must confront. The world is less stable, and we must invest more in the defence of our nation. This is what we are doing after those opposite allowed defence spending to fall to its lowest level since 1938. We have put in place a 10-year defence capability plan worth more than $270 billion, supporting more than 100,000 jobs. Yeah. Hobart-class air warfare destroyers built in South Australia, now in the water. Yeah. Combat vehicles maintained in Queensland, now in service. Yeah. And the F-35 Joint Strike Fighters with parts made in Western Sydney, now in the air. Yeah. And in this budget, we continue to make record investments in our Navy, in our Army and in our Air Force, expanding the size of our defence workforce at a cost of $38 billion, deepening strategic partnerships through agreements such as AUKUS and the Quad. And tonight I announce a new $9.9 billion 10-year investment in Australia's offensive and defensive cyber capabilities. Yeah. This is the biggest ever investment in Australia's cyber capabilities, creating 1,900 jobs, more data analysts, computer programmers and software engineers to boost our capacity to prevent and respond to cyber threats, keeping Australians safe is part of our plan for a stronger future. Yeah. Mr Speaker, 
Over the last three years, Australians have been tested. Drought, floods, fires and a global pandemic for which there was no playbook. Despite the challenges, our economic recovery is leading the world. This is not a time to change course. This is a time to stick to our plan. A plan that delivers cost of living relief now. A plan that creates jobs for the long term. A plan that guarantees the essential services and a plan that invests more in the defence of our nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, three years ago we said to the Australian people that under the coalition the economy would be stronger and we delivered. Yeah, yeah. That under the coalition more people would be in work and we delivered. Yeah, yeah. That under the coalition taxes would be lower and we delivered. Yeah, yeah. That under the coalition essential services would be guaranteed and we delivered. Yeah. And that under the coalition we would invest more in national security and we delivered. Yeah. This is a time to stick to our plan, a plan for a stronger economy and a stronger future. We will deliver. Hello again, that was the Treasurer Josh Frydenberg making the government's economic pitch for re-election. The Coalition's hope is to be rewarded for shepherding the country through the pandemic and now they're turning people's minds to the future, offering a few sweeteners to help with cost of living and unveiling a big spending package covering everything from defence to infrastructure to health. The question is whether the government has the balance right between being economically responsible and politically appealing. In a moment, I'll interview the Treasurer live, but first, here's James Glenday to run you through what's in the budget. When the cost of everyday items rise, politicians get nervous. And in the past year, the price of food, fuel, as well as healthcare and, of course, housing have all gone up. Congratulations. And there are fears more families could soon struggle to make ends meet. With an election just weeks away, the Treasurer knows his future and that of the Morrison government could hinge on tonight's budget. So, unsurprisingly, it contains a suite of sweeteners worth billions, aimed at easing the cost of living and clawing back votes. Hello? Is the Liberal Party now the party of big spending, big government? James, the Liberal Party is the party of lower taxes. As part of the cost of living package, the fuel excise will be halved for the next six months. From midnight, it'll be slashed from about 44 cents to 22 cents per litre, meaning owners of a mid-sized car could save about $12 a tank, though it will cost the budget around $3 billion. There's also a one-off $250 cost of living payment, which about 6 million people get automatically in April. It'll go to those on welfare, including pensioners, veterans and some concession card holders. About 10 million working Australians will also get a one-off tax bonus. $420 will be added to the low and middle income tax offset. Depending on what you earn, you could get up to $1,500 back, though the entire offset will end after this financial year. These measures are mostly being funded by an improvement to the nation's finances. Treasury expects the budget bottom line to be about $103 billion better than it did at Christmas because it underestimated how fast the economy would recover from the pandemic. The nation's deficits are still big, $78 billion next financial year. And by mid this decade, we're forecast to still be $43 billion in the red. But it's not as bad as first thought. 
That's again partly because the tax intake has been boosted by iron ore, gas, as well as coal prices, which are all higher than expected, while unemployment is lower and forecast to fall below 4% in a few months' time, meaning the government expects to spend less on welfare and get more in income tax. Tonight, the government is again promising wages are going to go up. It assumes that even though the cost of living is increasing rapidly now, over the next four years, it believes pay packets will grow even faster. These stats are going to be a big part of the election because for much of the past decade, these sorts of forecast wage increases have not materialised. There are also warnings pre-election spending risks overheating the economy, driving up interest rates and inflation faster. Isn't it an irresponsible measure simply to buy votes ahead of the federal election? You've got Australian families who will think it's a good idea to pay less at the Bowser. With unemployment so low and businesses searching for workers, the budget also has billions to increase skills and training. New apprentices will be eligible for up to $5,000, while employers who take them on could receive up to $15,000 in wage subsidies. Small businesses will also be incentivised to train staff. They'll get a $120 tax deduction for every $100 spent, and they'll get the same benefit for investing in digital technology. Given global events, the government plans to campaign on national security. The budget confirms large quantities of cash are being pumped into the military. And tonight, an extra $9.9 .9 billion is going towards improving the offensive and defensive cyber capabilities of the secretive Australian Signals Directorate. There's also pre-election cash tailored to different parts of the electorate, like $7.4 billion for regional dams and water projects, $2 billion for regional jobs, and more than $650 million to settle an extra 16,500 Afghan nationals. All this spending will see our debt peak at around $860 billion in a few years' time. Economists say it's manageable now, but could make the country more vulnerable to unexpected events. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And there's been quite a few of those lately. And as we've seen, budget predictions often swiftly disappear out the door. James Glenday reporting there. While the Treasurer makes his way from the floor of the Parliament to the ABC studio, I'm joined for analysis by 7.30's Chief Political Correspondent Laura Tingle and the ABC's Political Editor Andrew Probin. Let's start with uh, both of you. I want to know what your take is on it overall. Andrew, you first. Well, I think, uh, Lee, that for a pre-election spending splurge, this one is actually rather muted. Uh, they've uh, been very targeted and the spending will be in a concentrated uh, time. Uh, that's obviously to try and win over as many voters as possible. But you, you get the clear sense that the government would have liked to have done a whole lot more were it not for the fact that an inflation dragon is breathing down its necks. Next. So it's, it's spent and done as much as it thinks it can get away with. A, a second observation would be that we've all been wondering, Lee, what it was that uh, Scott Morrison gave Barnaby Joyce to convince him to support him on uh, net zero by 2050 before he flew off to Glasgow. It looks like it was at least $20 billion in regional infrastructure, think roads, dams, etc. So that was uh, one hell of a, an expensive plane ticket to Glasgow. Um, before we go to you, Laura, Andrew, you said spending was muted, but it's still at 27.2% of GDP. And by contrast, when the coalition was screaming blue murder about the level of Labor's spending, it was 25.9% of GDP at the height of the financial crisis. So in, in comparison, they're still spending a lot of government money. Uh, they are, but uh, when you look at uh, pre-election spending splurges, look at 2007 when the Howard government was in some trouble. It, it, it announced a, a tax cuts in the order of $27 billion, which Labor quickly ticked off. What I'm talking about here is the fact that uh, uh, inflation being such a, a problem for this government and uh, whoever wins the next election, that they had to be very careful about what they, uh, what they spent. And so consequently, I think some of the, uh, the spending has been curtailed for, for fear of what it might spark. Um, Laura, to you, what's your overall take? Well, clearly the, the big issue that's showing up in focus groups in which the government's trying to target is cost of living. Uh, and uh, Andrew's right that it's very targeted. You've got a, a range of measures aimed at basically getting the government through and people through the next six months. 
Uh, but where the government is vulnerable, I think, Lee, is that the budget papers are basically showing that uh, while we've got these you know, incredibly good uh, forecasts for the unemployment rate falling and a very tight labour market, wages aren't really going to be picking up and creating real wage growth for people over the next three or four years. It's still going to be pretty marginal. And yet, uh, only a couple of months down the track, despite all of these uh, cost of living measures, uh, the government is acknowledging in the budget papers that interest rates are going to start going up in the middle of this year and they're going to keep going up till 2024. So people are going to be facing higher mortgage costs. Uh, so there are a lot of pressures that are going to be coming on to people uh, but they're not, going to be fa they're not going to be helped by any of these measures in the budget beyond about the next six months. Uh, Laura, I'm being told that the Treasurer is standing by, so we'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much. And I am joined now by the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, for his first post-budget interview. Thanks for racing up, Treasurer. Nice to see you, Lee. Given the timing of this budget as a springboard for an election, how can any voter trust that it's about what's genuinely best for the nation rather than what's best to get the Liberal Party re-elected? Because what we've seen in tonight's budget is a dramatic and material improvement to the bottom line, as we've banked actually the vast majority of those revenue upgrades. Uh, and we, as a result, we see the deficit more than halving over the forward F estimates. We see, the, uh, we see debt also peaking earlier and lower. And then we've provided cost of living relief, which is really important to Australian families right now. This is the number one topic of discussion around the kitchen table. And we've done it in a practical, in a temporary, and in a targeted way. Uh, halving the fuel excise, providing the $250 payments to pensioners, veterans, carers, and others on income support, a $420 boost to the low and middle income tax offset that will go to more than 10 million working Australians, and cheaper medicines and access for both concession and con non-concession cardholders. These are very practical. These are very responsible measures that respond to people's needs. Well, you're giving, as you mentioned, voters $250 each within the next few weeks, uh, by total coincidence, time to land in the middle of an election campaign. When your own budget paper note that household disposable income has increased by 11% during the pandemic. Why is any further handout needed when many people have banked savings during the past two years? Well, when you speak to pensioners, when you speak to veterans, carers and others on income support, you know that the cost of living pressures are biting. Now, you've also got an indexation arrangement um, to the pension, which has seen a single pensioner receive more than $20 additional a fortnight from March. Uh, that will put over a six month period around $260 into their pockets. And then tonight we're boosting that with $250. Again, that is reflective of the challenges that they face. But I point what, out to what? you that the low and middle income tax offset actually doesn't get into people's pockets till after the 1st of July, and that's after the election. So uh, you, you can't have it both ways. Treasurer, what's contributing to cost of living is inflation and so therefore you have to be careful to not do things that are going to make inflation worse. How is it responsible to pump up government spending in an economy where inflation is a serious risk? Well, because these measures are very considered and they're temporary, they're targeted and they're responsible. And if you look at our fuel excise cut, uh, which will deliver to an Australian family with two cars who fill up once a week about $30. Uh, and then if they, over a six month period, about $700, that actually, according to Treasury, reduces inflation by about a quarter of a percent. So that's a result of cutting the fuel excise. So we've got the balance right. That's what we've sought to do uh, with temporary measures that go to the heart of people's needs. But Treasury is also warning in the budget papers that the combination of higher global inflation and mm. an historically tight labour market suggests that domestic inflation risks are tilted to the upside. So they're worried mm -hmm. inflation could get worse. Yet the actual forecast has inflation declining over the forward estimates. What's the basis for your optimism that from next year, inflation will trend downwards? Well, you're right that they lift inflation this year. And again, that's largely driven by those international events, not just the oil price, but the supply chain disruptions, which have seen freight costs increase by five times since the start of the pandemic. You've also seen wheat costs up 40% since uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So that's flowing through. But then Treasury see inflation moderating from four and a quarter percent this year to um, 3% uh, next year. And they point out that the wages price index as an indicator of wages 
wages growth is above inflation, which is good news uh, for working Australians. But wages, uh, you know, every budget I've covered, wages forecasts have been over-optimistic compared to what's actually happened. You're highly optimistic that low unemployment is going to fuel wage increases. But Treasury is warning that we've all already seen the unemployment rate fall faster and lower than expected without generating substantial pay rises. Why do you think that's going to change? Well, I wouldn't want to correct you, but I have to. Um, in last year's budget, I forecast wages uh, that would end, ended up being lower than what was delivered. They were half a percentage point higher than what I delivered in than what I forecast in last year's budget. But you so can't, actually, Treasury, you can't dispute that over, say, 20 years, there have been a lot of forecasts that we're going to see wage rises and then they've just stayed flat. Well, you're pointing then to the Labor Party's record as well, and I welcome well, that. You've but, been in power the, for nine years. Come on. But, but, the re but the record is this, that we are now heading to the lowest unemployment rate in some 50 years. Yeah, but I'm wondering and, why you think that's going to drive wage increases when it, it hasn't so far. For two reasons. Um, firstly, it just um, follows that when you've got a tighter labour market and employers are competing for workers, that that will put upward pressure. And secondly, there's another... Uh, wages indicator, which is called AENA, which I announced in the national accounts, which was at 3.3% uh, in at the in the December quarter, which will then is expected in these documents to rise to 5% by June, by the June quarter. Now that's a broader indicator of what wages and earnings, more importantly earnings, are happening across the economy. That's pointing to upward pressure. So but as more people get into work, we'll see upward pressure on wages. But if if business is going well and there's earnings, what your bank on is that businesses are going to be able to, well, they're going to pay better wages because there's fewer workers because unemployment's low. But mm. businesses at the same time, even if they've got good earnings, their supply costs, their transport costs are all going up. So mm. where is the money going to come from to give workers uh, additional wages when they're trying to meet very substantially increased supply costs? Well, again, employers will pay what they need to, to get the right workers. And you can only pay fact, what you've got, right? But, but as what we are seeing is a very strong economic recovery. And what we've encouraged in this budget is more uh, relief for small businesses with partic two particular measures to drive uh, their adoption of digital technologies, to drive their skilling of their workforce. What we've got is more infrastructure programs to support growth, particularly in our regions, all of which is going to drive a stronger economy where businesses are not just more productive, and competitive, but they're also more profitable. And that gives them the opportunity to take on more workers, to pay them higher wages, especially when right now the biggest issue facing businesses is workforce shortages. You've mentioned the cut to the fuel excise a few times. You've said that it'll be removed in six months. Is that timing simply a dirty bomb set for Labor if it wins the election? You, you'll turn around in six months' time and then blame them for a sudden increase in petrol prices? No, it responds to the here and now uh, where you've seen uh, petrol prices above $2 a litre and it's been largely driven by the events overseas with a barrel of oil up by 50% since the start of this year. But also in the budget, Treasury have forecast that the price of a barrel of oil will come down to around $100 uh, in the September quarter and it's on the 28th of September that we pivot off that cut in the, uh, in the fuel excise back to where it normally was. And what I've made very clear in my budget speech tonight is that the cut in the fuel excise is not coming at the cost of investments in roads. We're still committing $12 billion over the year to, to, to new road funding, which is very important and which is where normal fuel excise revenues go. We've had a situation where the market, you know, oil prices are greater, so therefore petrol prices are greater. So the market is potentially driving people out of uh, petrol cars because they think, oh, geez, maybe mm. I should move to an electric <laughs> car faster, right? Because petrol yeah. is so expensive. But what you've done is now distort the market because you've made petrol cars go back to being cheaper and you've changed people's focus perhaps from electric cars, which is supposedly what your renewable vehicles policy would aim to do. I think that's a long bow if I've ever heard one. This is a temporary targeted six month cut in the excise reflecting the challenges that Australian families face. And we know um, that people are voting with their feet and taking up electric vehicles and we're investing in the charging facilities so that we can see more electric vehicles roll out. But this is a cost of living uh, pressure that is hitting hard on households budgets. We've listened to them, we've acted, and you've seen that result in the budget tonight. On infrastructure spending, you've emphasised 11 national projects in your publicity documents, and a number of them are in areas where there are critical seats in play. So central and north Queensland, Tasmania, uh, the Hunter, the Northern Territory. 
The Auditor General's previously said that the granting of projects to politically desirable areas is a big problem in both sides of politics. How can people trust that these are the most worthy projects out there, not just the best pork barrels on election eve? Well, I think one of the more exciting aspects of this budget is our investments in the new economic frontiers. Those areas of our country, those re the regions in our country, which will supercharge growth and jobs and capitalise on what is a growing middle class in the region. So we're focused on the Northern Territory, it's called Middle Arm around Darwin. We're focusing on uh, Central and Northern Queensland around the Burdekin and we're also investing in Hell's Gate. The Pilbara is well known for its iron ore and of course it's good port facilities, but it's got great potential as well as an energy hub, as an export uh, hub for more, than, for more than resources. And then of course the Hunter as well, which is a well known region in New South Wales. We're investing in there. So we've got a very substantial regional package. It's more than just infrastructure projects. It's also investing in skilling, in regional universities, in modern manufacturing and recycling, as well as substantial health uh, programs to encourage more doctors into the regions, for example, greater access to MRIs, uh, as well as a substantial telecommunications package for our regions, because we know how important it is uh, for, for people in the regions to be digitally connected. But are you telling me it's just coincidence that so many of those projects have landed in areas and states that you really need to either win or hang on to to win the election? Well, by definition, regional Australia is largely held in coalition hands. Um, that's a fact. And we know that regional Australia uh, provides more than two thirds of Australia's uh, exports and in, in goods. And that is you know, a, a dramatic, a very significant asset for our country. So we want to further invest in these regional areas, Lee, because we need those new frontiers of economic activity if we're going to be able to significantly, substantially enlarge our economy so they can pay for those essential services like aged care, like the NDIS, like mental health, like hospital and school funding, which is of course, you know, priorities for us. When Labor was in power, I mentioned to Andrew Proben mm. earlier, the maximum their spending ever hit was 25.9% of GDP. And we all remember the coalition was screaming blue murder about how irresponsible that was. The coalition's now well above that and staying there. You said in your speech tonight, when Labor starts spending, they simply can't stop. Was that a typo? Was it shouldn't have been Liberals? Well, what the, the Labor Party does is not only that they don't stop spending, but they also increase taxes. And what you've seen during this pandemic is Labor commit to more than $80 billion of additional spending. When I ended JobKeeper, they said no, they wanted it to keep going. When we said to bring to the end the COVID disaster payment, they wanted to keep going. We ended those temporary measures. It was the right thing to do. It allowed the economy to stabilise. But there's no secret, Lee, we are facing increased pressures for funding on aged care, on the NDIS and for defence and national security. Yeah, but you didn't, you so we've taken those steps. You weren't acknowledging those pressures when the other side was in government. I'd point out to you as well that if you have a look um, at the size of the deficit uh, for this mm. year versus next year, it's 79.8 billion and then next year it goes to 78 billion. So really you're not making any inroads there over the next 12 months at all. Well, I think a very important take out of the budget is that we're seeing a more than $100 billion improvement by the end of the forward estimates. That's to the bottom line because what we have done is banked the dividend of a strong economy. Three quarters of those improvements to the revenue side have actually been delivered because more people are in work and fewer people in welfare. Unlike Labor, we haven't baked in high um, extended commodity price assumptions. We've been a lot more responsible. Our measures are targeted and there is a very strong story of improvement across the forward estimates where deficit as a percentage of the economy actually fall by more than half. You've always been honest that you'd like a shot at being the party's next leader, but if Scott Morrison loses the election, aren't you irrevocably tied to that loss because it's your budget that he's relying on to launch the campaign? Well, obviously, I'm you know, uh, focusing on winning the next election, but I'm very proud of the fact that Australia's economic recovery now leads the world. In the United States, there are millions of fewer people in the workforce than at the start of the pandemic. 
in Australia, there are 375,000 more people in work than at the start of the pandemic. Unlike the 80s and the 90s recessions under Labor, where the unemployment rate stayed elevated for some for a decade, we've actually reduced the unemployment rate below when we came to government. And the Labor Party said the single biggest test for our government's management of this recession would be what happens to jobs and unemployment. When they left office, it was 5.7%. Today, it's 4%. In the budget, we've printed 3.75%. So we stand every day of the week on our jobs record. But more importantly than our record is our plan for the future, which is laid out in tonight's budget. Treasurer, thanks for your time tonight. Thank you. ABC News presenter Jeremy Fernandez is in Newcastle. Jeremy, you've been gauging voters' reactions to the budget. Yes, indeed, Lee. Look, we've actually lured them to the pub, which is probably the best place to um, gauge their reactions, uh, tempt them with a drink and some food, and to ask them what they think about how this budget is going down. Now, this is the seat of Newcastle, traditionally a very safe Labor seat. It's surrounded by Labor-leaning areas as well, which have become more marginal over time. So we're talking about seats like Patterson, Shortland, Dobell, even Hunter. And then further afield, you've got seats like Lyne and New England, very strong manufacturing, logistics and agricultural hubs. And what that gives us is a big cross-section of the key issues that are affecting people right around the country. So that's why we've come here. We sat down with a few locals, the Liberal voters, the Labor voters, the undecideds, to ask them what's on their mind heading into budget night and the federal election. I think when you just see uh, more money spent in uh, your basic public services, your transport, your education, your healthcare, aged care, I think those are the really, really key places that we need to see money being spent. I filled up the car with petrol the other day and just you know, hitting over $100 for a very small car, you know, you think about it every single time, every single payment that you're making, it's going up and up and up, and yet our wages aren't following in the same way. Are they spending money on the right things? Well, they, you know, that they could have spent more money on dealing with the pandemic uh, more effectively. They certainly could have been more proactive in uh, dealing with climate change and the effects that that's having on uh, issues such as floods and bushfires and so on. If they can try and just make housing investment less attractive so that people that want to actually buy a home to live in it rather than rent their entire lives, I think that's something that could be quite significant. I have people moving out from the area because they cannot, seriously, they cannot afford it and they can go somewhere else. And I'm losing them as staff members. I'm losing them as employees. I'm after training them, this is all putting expenses back to the shoulder of the business. So, Lee, some very familiar refrains, not just for this area of Australia, but right around the country. Come back to us later on tonight. We'll be touching base with our voters to see how people in voter land, away from Canberra, are digesting Budget 2022. Thanks so much, Jeremy. David Spears is the host of the ABC's Insiders program, and he's with us now for his analysis. Um, David, what did you make of what the Treasurer had to say? Well, Lee, the Treasurer is really walking a fine line here. The challenge for him with this budget and what he's produced tonight is to simultaneously argue that, in his words, the time for emergency fiscal support has passed, while at the same time injecting a further $8.6 billion in fiscal support through that cut in the fuel excise and the cash handouts you've been talking to. This was always going to be the challenge that the politics dictate that the government does need to spend, needs to put money in people's pockets, turn around its own fortunes before the election. But the economy is in a different place to the politics. Uh, it is requiring a, a fair bit of moderation right now. And the government needs to, and the Treasurer needs to be careful not to spend too much here uh, to overheat things and force inflation up even higher, make the problem worse. So how's he gone in striking that balance? Is this a responsible budget given where the economy is at? Well, let's bring in Chris Richardson from Deloitte Access Economics economics and Danielle Wood from the Grattan Institute. Welcome to you both. Uh, Chris, to you first, just uh, explain to us how much has poured into government coffers thanks to the lower unemployment rate and higher commodity prices and how much of that is being spent? Uh, it's stunning dollars, truly stunning dollars, $143 billion extra uh, coming into the budget from the stronger economy. We recovered from COVID faster than expected. Uh, those coal and iron ore prices are much higher than the budget expected. They're delivering uh, basically every week 
those prices stay that high. National income is five billion higher and, and the tax man gets a bit over a billion of it. And the other thing though, uh, and to me in many ways the most interesting thing, Treasury says uh, the economy will be bigger ongoing because they can now run it faster than before. About 140,000 Australians can stay sustainably in jobs, Treasury is saying, are better than their estimates of three months ago. A lot of dollars in, about a quarter of it, $39 billion back out of Yeah, I think it's about 27% of the revenue that's coming in being spent here. And then the question, Daniel, is how responsible is that spending? Looking at the makeup of it, does anyone in your field think a fuel excise cut is a good idea? Well, indeed, and that, that additional spending is very front-end loaded. So we have the fuel excise cut, we have the payments to households and, and welfare recipients. Um, so, you know, I think economists will be worried when they see the size of that upfront stimulus. So it's about 1% of GDP over the next six months. Worried because they think it will push up inflation? That's right. So clearly, if you're pumping that much money into the economy, there is going to be some inflationary impacts from that. And you said the Treasurer is walking a line, but the Reserve Bank governor is also mm. trying to walk a line. And if the fiscal position is more expansionary, um, that is going to increase the likelihood that he has to move earlier. Well, this is the big question. Uh, is it going to bring forward the point at which official rates go up? Uh, Treasury argues that cutting fuel excise is bringing down uh, inflation just a little. Uh, and, it, and the other payments that are being announced tonight won't have that much of an impact. What do you think, Chris? Um, I think it is a risk. You know, basically, for a strong economy, we're adding extra dollars uh, into it. Uh, and the risk is the Reserve Bank says, well, that's too much, and they take the extra dollars back out through uh, higher interest So rates. this will make an interest rate rise earlier more likely? Uh, it'll make it more likely. We still think uh, the Reserve Bank will move later. That, you know, most economists are expecting something in the next few months. We are rather more confident that the Reserve Bank is enjoying these uh, lower rates of unemployment, is enjoying uh, an economy moving faster and is willing to run some risks around uh, inflation. But it is a very delicate line that everybody's walking, you know, has Treasury uh, and, and Treasury tempted him into an earlier rate rise. Well, the debate that no doubt will follow uh, this on another front is wage growth mm. and whether they're, they're credible, the forecast, and you heard Lee uh, asking the Treasurer about that, Danielle. When we look at what's happening in, in the employment market, this is a good news story. Unemployment's at 4%. It's forecast to go below 4% later this year. Is it credible to suggest that we will finally see wages growth, real wages growth, higher than inflation in the coming financial year? I actually think it, it is credible. It is a fantastic news story. So unemployment with a three in front in the next three months, you know, that's extraordinary. Done at the same time, the participation rate's actually gone up, um, you know, increasing working hours. So it's a good labour market story. Um, we know there's a lag between that sort of tighter labour market conditions and the flow through to wages because of things like enterprise agreements. It all takes a while to start hitting the economy. But I think it is realistic to say that we are going to start to see that um, over the next year. And the other part of that real wage story, of course, is they're predicting that inflation will come down by mid next year. So some of the sort of shocks around oil prices and food prices will work their way through. And so that idea that we would have a modest real wage increase from, from halfway through next year, I think is not unrealistic. And Chris, uh, just finally, the deficits, they're smaller, but they continue as far as we can see, as far as the forecasts go. Will someone, whoever wins the election, have to eventually bite the bullet? Yeah, look, it's a difficult conversation. We should have it. We probably won't have it before the election. Uh, and that's a shame. You know, our budget helped us defend against COVID. There will be other crises uh, in the future. And uh, Danielle, the women's budget statement, it's now an annual feature. It's, it's here. This is it. Is there much in it? Uh, look, it's pretty modest, about $2.1 in extra measures, which is sort of small, certainly in the context of the money that's flying around in terms of you know, transport, construction and defence. Um, there's $1.3 million around um, family violence, which I think is, you know, there's some really important measures there, so we should absolutely welcome that. Uh, there are some changes to the paid parental leave scheme uh, to make it more flexible as to who takes the leave. Uh, the concern there is that we'll actually see fewer fathers taking leave and, and more women taking the full allocation. So essentially they've got rid of the, the two weeks, use it or lose it for dads and partners. Um, but, you know, there are some, some worthwhile measures in there, albeit smaller ones. Thank you both for your take on that tonight, Daniel Wood and Chris Richardson. Uh, Lee, back to you. 
Thanks, David. For the opposition's view of this year's election budget, the Shadow Tre Treasurer Jim Chalmers joins me now. Um, Jim Chalmers, thanks for coming in. What's your overall assessment of the government's economic plan? Well, nothing in this budget, Lee, makes up for almost a decade now of attacks on people's wages and job security and pensions and Medicare. It's a pretty desperate political ploy when the country needed a plan for the future. Uh, it doesn't make up for the fact that people's real wages are falling. We've got a trillion dollars in debt with almost nothing to show for it. And all we've done here, or all the government's done here, is take a whole bunch of economic challenges before the election and push them to the other side of the election. So it's very short-sighted, very desperate, very panicked. Uh, and I think the government, I think the, the country deserved much better. I didn't interrupt you because it was your first answer, but nothing to show for it. I mean, when you look at what's happened around the world in the past two years, Australia has come out economically in a stellar position compared to almost every country in the world. And it's come out with better COVID outcomes than almost every country in the world. Doesn't the government deserve some credit for that? Oh, no, Lee, we should do better than the rest of the world. We've got some tremendous advantages. You know, we've said, for example, when it comes to the unemployment rate, we want that to be as low as possible. That's been falling in welcome ways. But the big uh, challenge in the economy, the big risk in the economy, the big risk of another three years of this government is that wages are falling, real wages are falling again. Uh, we do have that trillion dollars in debt. I don't think we've got enough of a legacy to show uh, for all of that money that's been borrowed. We've got this big cash splash before the election and hidden in the budget papers is at least $3 billion in cuts which the government won't come clean on until after the election. Uh, and so I don't think the self-congratulation from the Treasurer is warranted when Australian working families dealing with the skyrocketing costs of living and falling real wages are falling further and further behind. You mentioned cost of living. The Treasury papers note, as I said to Josh Frydenberg, that household disposable income is up 11% in the past two years. Inflation's less than half of that. Are politicians overstating cost of living pressures for political reasons? Of course not. You know, we've got petrol prices, grocery prices, building materials, rent are all going through the roof at the same time as real wages are going backwards. And so we do have families under genuine cost of living pressure. And the government is now pretending to care about those cost of living pressures because Scott Morrison has to call an election in the next fortnight. If they cared about cost of living pressures, they wouldn't have spent the best part of a decade coming after people's wages and job security. The government's cutting the fuel excise immediately with a plan to return it to normal in six months. Um, firstly, do you back it? And then secondly, if you're in government, will you put it back to normal in six months' time, even though you will no doubt then be accused of slugging Australians with higher petrol prices? I think that's part of the motivation from the government, frankly. I think they're taking a challenge from one side of the election and pushing it to the other side of the election. You know, clearly we're not going to stand in the way of cost of living relief for working families whose real wages are falling. We've foreshadowed that for some time, that we won't be standing in the way of that cost of living relief. But it is a fact under a government, I think, of either political persuasion, it'd be very hard to see any government being able to afford to maintain this uh, fuel excise cut. Uh, after the price of fuel goes up in September. I think one of the motivations from the government is to take this problem from March 2022 and just to uh, delay it until September 2022. There'll be some cost of living relief in the interim, uh, but there'll be a difficult period when prices of fuel goes back up. You might have heard me point out to Josh Frydenberg that Treasury is warning that the inflation risk to Australia is on the upside. Do you generally think that it's economically prudent for the nation to have government spending so high at the moment? I think it's the quality of spend that matters when it comes to inflation. That's why our economic plan, which is all about dealing with skill shortages, investing in the digital economy, cleaner and cheaper energy, a future made in Australia, uh, all of these sorts of issues, childcare reform to make it cheaper and more accessible. It's all about growing the eco economy strongly without adding unnecessarily to those inflationary pressures. But I Cost of living sorry, sorry to interrupt, but that, that is literally what the Treasurer just said, Al almost the exact same sort of form of words but about... But they, they don't have a plan, Lee, that goes beyond the May election. This is the most short-sighted budget in memory. It has a shelf life of about six or seven weeks. That's how the government intended it. We've got a genuine plan for a better future, which strengthens the economy without adding to those inflationary pressures. We recognise that there's a need for cost of living relief in the near term. So as Treasurer, would you be looking to reduce that spending as a percentage of GDP figure? Well, I've said before, Lee, and I mean it, and my view's been reinforced tonight. The quantity of spending does matter, obviously, but what matters more is the quality of that spending. We've had almost a decade now of rorts and waste and mismanagement, money that would have been better invested 
in the future growth of this economy and in more opportunities for more people. So I'd like to reprioritise the budget. I've already uh, uh, pointed to a few areas where the waste could be trimmed and so that we could get some of this investment because the quality of spending is what's been missing. There's been money spraying around for the best part of a decade now. The government's racked up a trillion dollars in debt, a big chunk of that before the pandemic. Uh, but we haven't had that value for money for Australians, and that's what I'd like to change. Jim Chalmers, thanks for your time this evening. Thank you, Lee. Let's go back now to ABC News presenter Jeremy Fernandez, who's in Newcastle. Oh, I'm told Jeremy's not there, so let's go back to David Spears instead. Where does this budget leave Labor room to move, David? Well, interesting to listen there, Lee, to Jim Chalmers. Clearly, Labor is not going to stand in between voters and a, a cheaper um, a price at the Bowser or indeed a cash handout, certainly not this close to an election. So they're backing in, they'll wave through all of those cost of living measures in tonight's budget. The argument, as you heard there time and again, is uh, that the quality of the spending is not adequate from this government, that it's too short-sighted. What will be interesting for Labor now, they're not going to pick a fight over, I don't think, any measures in this budget. Are they willing to spend more? They're not taking to this election anything like the scale of spending they took to the last one. They've learnt their lesson, but they still do intend to spend more on childcare. NBN, university places, TAFE and a few other areas. How do they find that money to pay for it? Well, they're talking about a few areas like multinational tax, but it, it may well be that they're prepared to spend a little more than the government, but argue it's a better quality of spend. Uh, and again, to hammering the message that wage growth has been a failure for the government. Well, let's pick that apart a little further. We're joined now by Jennifer Westacott, the Chief Executive of the Business Council of Australia, and Michelle O'Neill, the President of the ACTU. Thank you both for joining us. Jennifer, let me come to you first. Uh, uh, on the cost of living measures, and indeed the fuel excise cut, $3 billion uh, for that measure alone, is this the sort of reform you were hoping for, if, uh, set Australia up for post-pandemic success? Look, I think the budget does kind of get a balance between those um, cost of living pressures, those short-term uh, forms of assistance, and then laying the foundation for a stronger economic recovery. And there are lots of really good things there which we can come back to. But fuel excise? Still. Look, I think fuel excise, I mean, what's the alternative? I mean, people are really struggling here. And here is a lever that the government can pull. It gives them time to then do the real work that has to be done around a kind of national road user charging system, particularly taking account of the fact we'll have a lot of electric vehicles. But, you know, you've got very targeted measures. You've got one-off measures. You've got the, you know, $420 linked to the low-income tax offset. You've got the $250 payment. I'm just not sure what people think is the alternative when people are really struggling to put petrol in their cars and meet their household expenses. The big big job is, of course, the job that I think Michelle and I agree on, which is you've got to get wages higher over a longer period and we'll of time. And we'll come to that, Michelle, just on the cost of living relief, though. A lot of workers will probably welcome cheaper petrol and, and a few hundred bucks. Do you support what they've announced on that front? Well, when you're doing it tough, every bit matters, but nothing matters as much as a wage increase. And this budget completely fails we'll, we'll to come deliver to that. wage growth. We will come to that. But the cost of living relief? Well, one-off payments, David, disappear so fast. We don't see one-off increases in rent or in childcare or in grocery bills. So what are these one-off payments? They're something that'll get the government through a period to the election. But I don't think workers are going to be that easily bribed. I mean, I think people see it for what it is. It doesn't address the real issue for working people, which is their wages are going backwards. They went backwards in real terms on average $800 last year. And these figures tonight show they're going to lose another $500 in the first six months of this year. Well, yeah, let's talk about this. So the forecast is wages uh, are growing, but not as much as inflation, certainly for the rest of this financial year. And then they start to overtake uh, just only just uh, in, the, in the next financial year. Um, Jennifer, would you like to see more immediate pay rises? Well, I'm not sure how you do that if you don't then do the work that gets the economy moving. If you don't do the work on increasing productivity to obviously make sure that we're expanding our businesses, that we're growing our businesses, that we're growing our exports, that we're skilling people up to do higher paid jobs, that we're attracting investment into the country. Those are the ingredients for sustained wage growth, as well as uh, fixing our enterprise agreement system, restoring it, because that's the that's the basis on which people get paid more. Is either side willing to touch that? Well, I, I, I hope that post-election people get back to the table. And the ACTU and the BCA did some very, very good work on this. You and came I, pretty close. We came very close. And I think, you know, Australians want and expect people not to just dig in on turf wars. They expect them to sort of be in, acting in their interests. And I think people have got to go back to saying, you know, how do we get 
wage growth sustained across the whole of economy. And the problem with what we're seeing now is wage inflation, which is patchy and which actually is counterproductive. So what people tell me is that that wage inflation, that spiking, just means they either do less, I, you know, I'm not opening my restaurant five days a week, I'm opening it three, or they don't do some of the projects that they were going to do. So we've got to address the whole issue of skilled labour, getting people skills, but making sure that we've got a sustained effort on wages. Well, I know the unions have been waiting to see tonight's budget before finalising a submission for this year's minimum wage case. What do you think now? Well, we know that what the government failed to do is actually say that they're going to support us with a submission to the minimum wage case. This is happening this week. This is a measure the government could do this week to make a difference to one in four workers. One in four workers are dependent on what happens with that minimum wage what case. What would your submission be? Well, we'll be announcing the detail of our submission in the next day or two, David, but what I know is that we need to see wages that are increasing above what is currently currently the cost of living. Which is and about three and a half or more percent. So you'll be seeking a minimum wage rise above that? Uh, absolutely. You know, people need to see both uh, it being in front of the cost of living, but also they need to share in, have some share in productivity. And to Jennifer's point, workers are, have the lowest share of productivity growth than we've ever had. Like the labour share of our GDP has been shrinking and continuing to shrink. So the problem is not just that we need productivity to increase. The problem is workers aren't getting any share of that and are not getting a fair share of it. A couple of quick ones. Uh, there are some additional measures tonight for small business, encouraging them to uh, you know, invest in training and, and, mm. um, uh, and some, uh, some other yep. cyber uh, efforts as well. But for, for bigger business, the immediate expensing comes to an end. It's been yeah. a feature of the last couple of years yeah. under the pandemic. Most businesses were able to access this. Are you okay with that? Look, I think at some point, someone has to come to terms with those low business investment numbers. You look into the forward estimates, you look in the outer years, you've got business investment really falling away when that expensing measure finishes. Mm. And you've got GDP with the two in front of it again, GDP growth. That's a problem if we want to actually have a high wage environment. So we've got to, at some point, come to terms with the fact that we are not an attractive destination for investment. But Nate, make no mistake, mistake, that expensing allowance did a lot of very, very good work. A lot of projects got happen. up. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, the government is, is sort of like trying to wean people off mm. this kind of support. What we need is a permanent change to our tax arrangements to make it more competitive. But the stuff for small business is really good. You know, the digital stuff, the training stuff, really, really good. All right, Jennifer Westergott, Michelle O'Neill, thank you both very much for joining us Thanks. tonight. Lee, back to you. Thank you, David. Let's try again now to go back to ABC News presenter Jeremy Fernandez in Newcastle. Lee, hello. I want to introduce you to some of our voters now, people who've been watching the budget speech from the Treasurer tonight. This is Bob Hawes. Bob is the CEO of Business Hunter, the local business chamber. Bob, uh, you'd need a few hands to count how many times the Treasurer mentioned Newcastle, the Hunter, regional Australia. Your thoughts on what his speech contained tonight? Yes, there were significant touch points mentioned by the Treasurer that I think have all implications for the future for the region, you know, across defence, medtech, infrastructure, um, so it was all good. Energy, another one, and I, and I think, you know, what our ambition is here for this region, um, we've got some real opportunity, hopefully, out of this to, to make something of it. Business has been really struggling in this region, you know, when you think about the transition away from coal, you're thinking about the, uh, the effects of the pandemic in manufacturing, supply shortages, staffing shortages. Does this budget go far enough to mitigating those issues? I think it's going to help. Um, you're right, it's been very, very difficult in the circumstances of coming out of COVID and, and we've had been a very patchy recovery really up here. Um, some businesses have gone really well. Visitor economy businesses and things like everywhere else in Australia have struggled. And they've got a limited opportunity to be able to pass on some of those increasing costs that they are experiencing. So hopefully there's some release in some of these tax measures that help them. How much are those costs being passed on to consumers right now? And how much can business afford to absorb these costs for the short term? Well, I think that's patchy as well. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly the, the consumer businesses are very, very sensitive. But we know that there's a lot of our manufacturing, construction-based businesses are being forced to pass it on. They haven't got a, haven't got a choice. There's been no alternative. So 
uh, it's been quite quite different across the region. Bob, thank you very much. Now, I want to introduce you to Luke Tills. Now, Luke is a local publican here in Newcastle. Right, Luke, yeah. you're a business operator. Tell me about what you thought about how this budget came down. Oh, again, they've sort of tried to cover all the bases that they could. Um, obviously, small business owner. I, I find it hard to sort of be positive about this government after they sort of abandoned us uh, in the last six weeks of the pandemic. We had that. This is the big Newcastle outbreak. The big Newcastle outbreak. When you were calling out for the, the assistance yeah, and it never really came. Well, the, tre the New South Wales Liberal Treasurer begged for assistance from yep. the federal government. We all begged for assistance and they didn't come to the party. And now they're offering, I, I heard them mention something about training programs and stuff like that, which would be great for training providers, but I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's going to trickle down to us and directly help us. Staffing shortages, supply shortages, how are they affecting you? And when the uh, Treasurer talks about um, you know, unemployment going down even further, it'll be people like you who are paying more for staff for that minimum wage, to, that, that you know, kind of uh, wage to go up. Yeah, it, look, it, it, I'm not against wages going up, but look, once you raise wages, then you have to pass that on to your consumers. So, look, that's that's fine, but that sort of negates the whole thing. If those people who are earning more money are going out and spending the same, yeah, you know, more money at the places they go, then it sort of negates the whole purpose of the thing. They haven't really talked about the the big elephant in the room. They, they mentioned it, but housing prices have gone through a 40% increase in the past couple of years up here. Like the $250 and the $480 and whatever, the packages. All that cost of living measures. That yeah. of living measures. It, it's like, that's one week's rent for someone, you know? Like the, like the big thing that I saw Scott Morrison talk about today, the $90,000, if you're on a $90,000 income, you, over the last few years, you're gonna save $50 a, a week in tax. Like that's nothing compared to what the cost of living pressures brought on by higher rents and higher house prices are going to bring to this region in particular. All right, Luke, uh, Bob, thank you both very much. Uh, we're going to keep touching base with the voters we've gathered here tonight, people from all sides of the spectrum to see what they think of how, how this budget is going down. Lee. Jeremy, thank you. And please thank those two gentlemen for talking to us this evening. The ABC's political writer, Annabelle Crabbs, in the studio with me tonight. Um, what do you reckon? Well, you know, sometimes it's hard to remember that this is this government's ninth budget because we've had such an action-packed decade. And I couldn't help but think this afternoon while I was reading this budget of the government's very first budget that was delivered in 2014 by Joe Hockey. That was the one that was kind of like a boatload of horrors that largely didn't happen because of the Senate blocking a whole lot of it. And I think that this budget is sort of um, related. It's got a lot of nice things in it some of which may not happen. I mean, there's stuff that will happen straight away. I mean, petrol excise is taking effect as of tonight and then um, upfront payments follow soon after. But when you look at the longer, um, the longer programmed delivery of spending, some of it may not happen because the coalition might lose this election that we're about to have. And the way that some of the other spending is structured is a bit mysterious in the budget papers. You know, this budget paper too, which tells you um, the pace and structure of the spend. And a bunch of the big ticket items, like for instance, the $4 billion for the um, WA shipbuilding um, uh, project that was uh, um, announced very recently, um, and the billion dollars for the Great Barrier Reef, um, and also another billion dollars in a collaboration funding for um, universities and industry. When you go to budget paper two, there's no actual figures in the budget out years for those projects. Now, it's either because it's sort of re restructured spending that's already been announced, or maybe it's um, pushed out beyond the budget out years in budget paper two. And I know this sounds technical, but in 21 budgets, I've never seen that happen before in budget paper too. And then you look at the rest of the um, offering and it's kind of like this Meccano set of projects across, um, across the Australian continent. And the infrastructure projects, which as you pointed out earlier, coincidentally do seem to correlate very closely to areas that the coalition need to recapture or retain at the forthcoming election, really only makes sense when you roll out an electoral map over them. Yeah, because I mean, I had a look at them all to, to see, okay, is, is there a narrative around this where you can see that they're targeted in a certain direction? And they were so kind of disparate mm -hmm. um, that, as you say, the only way that the only thread you could put together was that they did involve a lot of places where the coalition needs to win or hold seats. Yeah. And although, I mean, I take Josh Frydenberg's point that people are fanning back out into the regions, which is a pretty great thing, I think, for our nation. But also, I mean, <laughs> it's we're in an environment, right, where the construction sector is overstimulated to the wazoo, right? I mean, anyone who's trying to do a renovation at the moment, you can't get um, wood, you can't get steel and, and 
cement builders, uh, tradies. <laughs> sure, yeah. right? Like so, I mean, it's a pretty bold call to roll out eighteen billion dollars of building in an environment where the construction sector is red hot. But we kind of, I think, now are um, uh, just firmly of the view that construction jobs are the important jobs to fund uh, in budgets, and um, politicians love to put on hard hats and you know look at you know pace out new areas for construction and so on, and of course tell people in needy electorates that you know one day there'll be a highway running through here. But is that a good, you know, Jim Chalmers was talking about a quality spend. Is um, your bang for your buck spent on construction the best use of that money? Well, it depends what you're after because infrastructure we know is great for productivity, it's good for um, increasing transport um, options and so on. But if you're trying to um, uh, create jobs, which is often how these, these um, projects are pitched, actually you don't get a huge job creation bang for your buck out of construction. So I think the Australia Institute Institute recently did a really interesting report where they calculated that every million dollars of construction spend creates uh, one uh, direct job for a man and 0.2 direct jobs for a woman. But a million dollars spent on education, for instance, creates uh, 10, I think, jobs for women and four and a half for men or something. So if, you, if you're looking for job creation or to address underemployment, there are probably better ways that you can spend the money. You've done 21 budgets, I've done 14. Um, petrol comes up a lot <laughs> uh, and again this year. <laughs> Something goes weird in the brain of our legislators when high petrol prices uh, accompany a threatened political debacle or uh, electoral defeat, right? And you'll remember in 2001 when John Howard, after months and months of being ragged about petrol prices that were, you know, soaring up towards the $1 mark, would you believe, after spending months and months explaining that it would be rash, foolish, pointless to cut petrol excise. I'll never forget the day that he announced that he was not only cutting petrol excise, but that he was abandoning indexation altogether. And so indexation stopped for 14 years after that announcement. And the Australian budget was something like 50 billion dollars to the worse for that, de that decision, which no one was brave enough for years to reverse. And eventually, Joe Hockey did it in the aforementioned 2014 budget and got absolutely slammed. But he said that poor people don't really drive cars that much, so it was That's really right. it was really nastier for the wealthy people. <laughs> don't think we're going to see one, anyone from the government saying that this is going to um, advantage disproportionately wealthy people. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens in six months and who's got responsibility for uh, dealing with that issue when it comes up. Annabelle Crabbe, thank you very much. Thanks, Lee. Thank you for watching the first hour of our budget coverage in this critical election year. Don't go anywhere. The analysis continues now with David Spears at the helm and I'll see you tomorrow night at 7.30 for an interview with the Prime Minister. Thanks, Lee, and welcome back. Coming up this hour, we're going to drill into the politics of this pre-election budget with Andrew Proben and Laura Tingle. Will the fuel excise cut, the cash bonuses, the promise of wage growth turn the government's fortunes around before the Prime Minister calls the election, which could be very soon? We'll also take a closer look at what's in this budget for the care sector, in particular the disability and aged care sectors. The architect of the NDIS, Bruce Bonahady, and Ian Yates from the Council on the Ageing will be with us shortly. And Jeremy Fernandez continues to bring us some of the immediate voter reaction to this budget. First, let's recap the main points. Cost of living relief forms the centrepiece of tonight's budget. Fuel excise is being halved for six months from 44 cents a litre down to 22 cents. That'll take effect from midnight, but it will take probably two to three weeks, we're told, for it to flow through to the local petrol station. This is a six-month tax break. It'll cost $3 billion to the budget. A $250 cost of living payment goes to pensioners, carers, veterans and the unemployed. They'll all receive that in the coming weeks. That'll cost $1.5 billion. And more than 10 million low and middle income earners who are already due to receive the low and middle income tax offset at the end of this financial year will now receive a special 420 cost of living bonus on top of that. So that's for those earning up to $126,000 a year. They won't get it till after July and it'll cost the budget just over $4 billion. The government's always chasing the small business and tradies vote. Tonight, there are some fresh incentives for those with a turnover of less than $50 million, a depreciation bonus for any spending on digital upgrades like an e-payment system or, or boosting your cyber security. You spend $100, you can then deduct 120 
and that same bonus applies for small business spending on external training for staff. The main thing to look at in the economic forecasts is wage growth, and it's finally overtaking inflation, but only just. Previous forecasts have proven to be a little overly optimistic on this. Uh, tonight's budget suggests inflation will peak this financial year at 4.25%, then ease to 3%, while wage growth climbs to 3.25%. So prices will keep outstripping wages for a few more months before finally catching up in the next financial year. The unemployment rate is forecast to keep falling below 4% to a 50-year low of 3.75. And finally, the budget bottom line is improving. We're still looking at deficits as far as the eye can see, but in total, they're worth about $100 billion less over the next four years than had been forecast in December. Net debt is set to peak uh, slightly lower as well. Now, the better bottom line and the promise of a pay rise are likely to be the government's primary focus during the coming election campaign. Workers are being told wage growth, as we saw there, is finally set to overtake inflation. So how realistic is that? Casey Briggs takes a look at the budget's key assumptions. It's been a bumpy couple of years for the economy. The pandemics sent economic indicators all wackadoo. After all, remember three years ago when the Treasurer announced... ..that the budget is back in the black and Australia is back on track. Yeah! Budget surpluses as far as the eye could see. Budget surpluses that never occurred. And tonight, the budget's covered in red ink. An estimated $80 billion deficit this year, shrinking to $40 or $50 billion in years to come. Those are the national accounts, but what about our personal ones? Just three months ago, the Treasurer upgraded the outlook, saying Australians would finally see an increase in their real wages next year. That is, we'd have a year where wages growth was bigger than inflation. But the vibes shifted. That now looks shaky. Let's start with our take-home pay. Wages growth has been sluggish in Australia for going on a decade. For years, governments have been prematurely saying it'll rebound, although it must be said last year's forecasts have turned out a lot closer to the money than the years before. And Treasury has now upgraded its view, suggesting wages growth will reach three and a quarter percent by June next year. But the budget papers also warn there's significant uncertainty around that estimate. That's all dandy, except for the fact that the cost of living is going up right now too. When we talk about cost of living rises, we're often referring to CPI or inflation. And at the moment, that is above 3%, higher than was expected. Last year, the budget forecast, it would be getting below 2% pretty soon. Instead, the government now thinks we're looking at double that, with inflation hitting four and a quarter percent in June this year, but falling back to three by 12 months later. The oil price is making inflation pretty volatile at the moment. Transport costs are rising faster than any other product category. And the inflation data we've got doesn't yet include the soaring fuel prices of this month. The government thinks halving the fuel excise will constrain that a little, theoretically reducing inflation by a quarter of a percentage point. So there's a wages increase beyond inflation for Australian workers penciled in in this year's budget. But just like the government's plans to get the budget back in black disintegrated, so too could that real wages growth turn out to be a mirage. After all, it's 2022 and everything's a bit wackadoo. Pretty sure that's a technical e economics uh, term there, a bit wackadoo. Uh, all right, well, on the eve of an election, this was always going to be a highly political budget. So how will it be judged? Will it turn around voter sentiment? I'm joined by the ABC's Laura Tingle and Andrew Proben. A very good evening to both of you. Let's look at the politics of the cost of living measures here tonight first up, right? So you've got the, the fuel excise cut, the, the payments that are going to pensioners, the unemployed, and then from July, those on low and middle incomes. Laura, I guess the immediate, uh, uh, the first to arrive will be that fuel excise cut. Tonight. Tonight, although Tonight. a couple of weeks apparently before you'll, you'll notice it at the Bowser. How do you think voters, motorists, will react to this? Will they shrug their shoulders or will they say, OK, this is helpful? Well, they're not going to, they're not going to say no, are they? I mean, it, it, all of these measures sound like the government's doing something. But I think the real issue here is there, it is so short term. I mean, it's not just that this is a six-month measure. It's 
the fact that interest rates are going to start going up in a couple of months' time. And I think uh, the, the real trick here will be that, for example, this uh, one-off increase in the Lemington, as the, uh, as the nerds call it, the low and middle income tax offset, sounds great. You're going to get 1500 bucks or 3000 uh, bucks uh, from July 1 when you put in your tax return instead of something a bit less than that, $420 less than that. But not only will you not be getting that next year, but they're going to take the whole thing away, mm. um, which in some ways is, is courageous, as they say. Um, and it had to come to an end. It had to come to an end, and it's probably good that it did. Uh, but once again, it raises the question further down the track about what you get, do about real tax reform. Uh, but uh, the fact that you know, that, that just highlights the fact that these are really short-term measures for what is going to be a long-term problem. And as Casey's package pointed out, wages aren't exactly taking off. I mean, you know, th those figures you were quoting earlier on, 3% yeah. inflation and 3.25% uh, wage growth, whoopee do. And I think the interesting, or is it wacky do? Like wha wha technical wha term. Wha do. I mean, I think the interesting thing here, once again, is if you look at the budget papers, they're not talking about the old fashioned, you know, wage increase where the, the minimum wage lifted and all boats floated. We're talking about people, and this is what they say in the budget papers, this is about people job hopping to get a wage rise, employers giving them one-off bonuses to keep them. It's, it's a really scatty wages market and people won't be confident that they can actually necessarily get that money if they're in a reasonably stable job. Well, we'll look at how the two sides, uh, Coalition Labor, stack up on how to get wages growing. But just yeah, coming back to the, the fuel tax cut and the, and the handouts that are coming. What do you think, Andrew? Is this going to jolt voters' attention? Well, back into as, as we've been discussing, it's a very political budget, and so they want to get some political heft out of it. Now, um, what have we seen in recent weeks and months? We've seen petrol prices fluctuate incredibly. Mm. We've had it up to 220, 225, 230. It's gone down back to two two dollars. Um, just because the oil price has been doing all sorts of funny things, 35 US dollars in the space of a few days. So the the, the so risk will, will voters notice? Well, this is they might not even notice, and and even if uh, it, it if it does take two weeks, where um, for the prices to actually be taking effect. We're not going to have that glorious moment, the TV moment that every government in this situation would want, where the guy changes the, the numbers on the at the front of the the bowels. I mean, that's not going to happen. This is going to happen over, over weeks. And for the for the low and middle income earners, they're not getting uh, this Well they don't get anything until after July. Exactly. And, so, uh, and, and but, but presumably the government will spend the, the campaign saying this is coming, this is coming. This is coming, this is coming. But where does it hurt most? It's hurting right now because as this budget confirms, the difference between wages in 2021-22, that's the financial year you are in now, and inflation is is 1.5 percentage points. So that's you know most wage earners are going backwards. Yeah. And well, let's um, talk about this. So and, and Labor clearly, and you heard Jim Chalmers tonight talking to Lee. Uh, it's all about wages, and this government's failed on wages. Does Labor have a credible plan to get wage growth going? Well, I think there are two things. The first one is, do we really think that Labor's uh, going to do something different on uh, what the government's spelled out on fuel excise mm. and uh, these once-off payments? I think not. So there's not going to be product differentiation there. But what they're capable, you know, what, what this gives them, the, 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 what the, this gives them the capacity to do is to s start to really focus people's minds on saying, well, look, yeah, this is fine, but look at the, the, look at the sort of scattiness of the wages market. This is all they can offer you when the market is so tight. This is because of insecure work. This is all the sorts of stuff we've been talking about. I mean, for example, um, there's no m mention in tonight's budget about whether the government will support the uh, work value case for aged care workers who are paid up to you know, 25 to 48% for some aged care nurses. Which less they, they, the, than whole, nurses. the whole way through this, they've kept a. They just, they, yeah, they just won't touch it. Labor's saying they'd make a positive submission. That's right. They haven't committed, though. They haven't committed yet, but you know, we've got a wage case sort of basically going to a national wage case uh, being, running sort of in the next month or so, plus this work value case. I think it's going to really sort of focus attention once again on what the mechanisms are that are 
available to the government to advocate for everybody to get a decent wage rise. And, and, and the government just has choked on this. And, and before uh, then, we've got the minimum wage cases as, mm. as well coming up too. But look, Labor would uh, argue too that it's childcare spend is a productivity measure. That is going to boost some productivity and, and uh, that helps wages uh, generally as well. Is that, is that um, enough there, do you think? Well, look, it might help, but I think the, the fact is that no-one knows anymore how low you've got to go with unemployment to force wages up. I mean, there's that awful term called Nehru. I don't think we'll bother going into Nehru, but Nehru is, a, is, a, is discussed inside the, the budget. It's basically the point at which wages will start rising. It used to be five. They think it could be 4.25. It's probably in the threes. We're heading into the threes, um, but wages are still um, hopeless. They're practically stagnant. Now, it, it's, a, it's a very unpleasant truth facing both sides of politics that no one really knows how they can prod wages to get, a, to get some speed into it. But that unemployment figure you mentioned, it is a significant uh, figure. I mean, 4% now, 3.75. And it's very good. It's yeah. very good because what does it also do? It means that we can um, recover uh, this, get this economy back into, I won't say black, uh, <laughs> the greys. Um, well, it show, it's, 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 it's a stronger, faster recovery. They're Josh Frydenberg's words than many other countries, the US, UK, all that. Um, and, and that's true. And you would think that's their strongest uh, selling point from this budget going into the election. Do voters look around the world, though, and compare how economic recoveries are going elsewhere? Look, I think um, we're in an age, uh, I was talking to a pollster today who uh, went into a budget uh, uh, focus group a couple of years ago or some years ago and said, so what do you think of the budget? And half of the people didn't even know the budget had happened. Um, I think this and is the problem. they're not watching tonight? They're, no, uh, tragically. Well, I'm leaving. As glamorous as we all are, <laughs> I don't think they're all watching. Um, I think, you know, they might pick up a bit of a message on petrol. Um, they're not going to pick up Nauru or, you know, a lot of the wages things, but there is the capacity there just for, you know, the chinks of, uh, of messages to get through that there may be a different alternative um, under, under Labor. I think it, Laura's absolutely right. I think if, if three things get through, it'll be in this order. Number one will be fuel. Petrol. Yep. Number two will be the 250. 250 payment that goes to pensioners mm. and uh, concession card holders. Yep. And thirdly, I think the Lamido, because quite frankly, people have, have been expecting that every single year. What won't have filtered through is that that's it. This is the final stop on the Lamido uh, bandwagon. What also probably won't filter through is the budget bottom line. I'm not sure, you know, some voters do care about it clearly, but... Um, not many. Well, it doesn't sound like the government cares about it much. Well, let's anymore. talk about that because, we, yes, we've got improvement about just over $100 billion worth of improvement over the coming four years. But still, you know, pre-pandemic measures, it's still big, big deficits, right, by, by any standard. Um, and we've got a structural deficit there, don't we, Laura? When you look at, you know, yes, that pandemic spending might wash through, but there's a fascinating uh, figure. I'll, I'll just find it myself here again. NDIS spending, and I hadn't seen this figure until tonight's budget papers, it goes from about $34 billion a year next year to more than double that, more than $70 billion in 10 years. Yeah. And, That's huge. And aged care is forecast to rise by 9.4% real terms in the next four years. And when mm -hmm. you think about the dollars involved, it's staggering. Now, that's the reality. You know, we've got an older population. We're going to have to spend that money. What is unsaid in this budget, uh, but which is there for all to see, is that the government is forecasting. They're saying, well, we might get back towards black in 2032, i.e. in 10 years' time. But when you look at it, uh, outlays are going to be at something above 26% of GDP. There's been a one-off up, step up in spending since, um, since uh, pandemic, which isn't related to, the, to COVID spending as yeah. such. And the government is stubbornly saying we're going to keep tax at 23.9. That is a, a structural deficit baked in for the next decade, and um, nobody's talking about it, yep. certainly not in this uh, in budget. No, and, uh, and look, nor is Labor flagging that they're suddenly going no. to uh, repair that. Yeah. You know, well, you, won't, you only fix it with tax or spending. And or commodity prices remaining. Now, this we need to Well, this about. is remarkable too. Now, I mean, we're all fascinated in iron ore and coal. I know I am. But there is this little element inside the... I mean, the, the sad truth is that Australia's doing pretty well out of what's happening in Ukraine. Like, no one wants to talk about it, but we're doing damn well, thank you. Um, if iron ore and coal remain at the prices they are now for another six months, 
is an extra $30 billion to the federal budget. For, for, for a six-month period. For a six-month period. Now, they're not, they're not, they're being more conservative, though, in their forecasts, which is Being very small. conservative. So, for example, you know, metallurgical coal is, is, is about $512, according to the budget at the moment. It's probably a bit more. Um, but... Uh, they're assuming it's about 130 or we'll get to 130. Same with uh, iron ore, it's, they're saying, assuming 55, it's about just, 130. Just very quickly, when does he call the election and does this change much? I'm presuming he calls it either on Friday or Sunday. I think he's going to do it later next week. All right, and is this a game changer? I don't think it is. I don't think, it's a, it, I don't think it wins many votes. It doesn't have much sparkle and I, had, I don't think it's going to shift any votes. Laura? Not going to change much. All right. Thank you both very much for your analysis tonight. Busy few days and weeks ahead. The ABC's Jeremy Fernandez has been testing immediate voter reaction to this budget in Newcastle. Jeremy, how's it going down? David, our Tuesday night pub test of this federal budget continues. I want to introduce you to Linda Drummond. Now, Linda, you work two part-time jobs, which yeah. somehow seems to equal more than full-time work, <laughs> but that's up to you. Yeah. Your husband works full-time. You've got a daughter living at home. She's a university student. I know cost of living has been a big issue for you. What's it been like over these past few weeks and months? Yeah, well, I think, you know, like everyone, we've been impacted. We're lucky. We've got a multiple income household, so we can afford it. But certainly every time I go shopping, I think $10 for a cauliflower. Like, come too. on. Yeah. yeah, filling up the tank with petrol, which is why I was really disappointed to see, you know, nothing in there about electric vehicles. There was nothing in there, particularly. I don't so think... this is about the reliance on oil. Yeah, 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 I think so. So I think that, you know, certainly... What we've seen there is we've seen a lot of short-term one-off payments and budget sweeteners. So, so there were the, the, you know, the low to minimal income tax offset, there's those extra sort of tax payments for low-income earners, um, for retirees. That doesn't kind of sweeten you up a little bit? Well, not really. I thought it was a budget for the over 40s, but um, for me, I'm thinking more for my daughter's generation and, you know, the impact on them and, you know, how they go about affording a job affording a house and, you know, where their jobs come from as well. So do you think this budget sets out a good future for your daughter? She's 22, she's a university student, she's studying law at university. What does the future look like for her? Yeah, well, you know, so she's, she's currently working, so she's working part-time while she goes to university, you know, in a law firm. And um, I don't, I couldn't see anything in there for her, to be honest. So, and I think, you know, we often look for ourselves in budgets, but couldn't see, it, couldn't see her. And I didn't particularly see me in any way that would make a big impact. All right, Linda, thank you very much. Now, I want to introduce you to Erin Foster. Now, Erin, you um, had a lot of priority placed on issues around women's health, women's sport, women's safety. We heard that in the budget. How's it going down with you? I think it's a nod in the right direction. I probably had hoped for more and expected less. So I think this is, a, this is a probably a fair place to end up. What do you like about what you heard from the Treasurer tonight? I was quite pleased to see the funding for endometriosis. There's a lot of areas of women's health that could have, um, could have been a focus and hopefully will be a focus in future years and future budgets. But I think endometriosis is a particular case because it affects a lot of women from the time they're very, very young. And the funding will, should, ideally, um, help get those young women access to care that will help them not spend a quarter of their life in pain and unable to focus on school, which can impact their capacity to study and, and learn and impact their future earnings going forward. I want to ask you about cost of living. How's that affecting you right now? It's been ugly. It's, it's been really ugly. I, I think we've seen a lot of, um, of short-term, you know, um, sort of attempts to, to correct some of the impact. I've seen some characterisation of the budget as perhaps a band-aid solution. I don't think that's a fair characterisation, but even if it was, sometimes a band-aid's what's needed. I'm, I'm, not, un, I'm not unhappy with a band-aid when there's a short-term issue, and there's definitely one at the moment, and I'm hoping the sun keeps shining in future years and we can do some more Going forwards. Okay. Uh, Erin, thank you so much, and Lindy to you too. Our pub test, uh, Speezy, continues in a moment, so come back to us a bit later on tonight. Looking forward to it, Jeremy. Thank you very much. So, is this budget actually addressing the issues of greatest concern to voters? We're hearing some reaction there. The ABC's Indigenous Affairs editor, Bridget Brennan, is also heading up the Vote Compass team for this election and joins me now. Bridget, good evening to you. First, remind us what Vote Compass is. Well, David, Vote Compass is an excellent and handy tool designed by political scientists to give voters an insight into what's so important to them when they go to the polls this year. And it gives us a real 
really broad picture of what's what's really critical to all Australians around the country at a regional and national level. Um, so you log on to ABC online, answer a few questions, and it gives you such a great insight into, into where you might be landing on the political spectrum and how your views align uh, to the positions of the major, major parties this year. So what did it tell us at the last election about voters' key concerns? Well, it feels like 2019 is a lifetime ago, David, um, given so much has changed in the last couple of years. We've been through a pandemic, of course. But actually, in 2019, what we know is that around about 29% of Vote Compass respondents said the environment was their top concern. And that was a massive shift from 2016, when only 9% said the environment, including issues around climate change, um, was, was a concern for them. Uh, environment was closely followed by concerns over the economy, so about 23% of Vote Compass respondents said that the economy was front of mind for them, followed by healthcare and superannuation. So also key issues for voters in 2019. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned what's happened since. I mean, the pandemic's the big one, of course. Uh, there are also heightened concerns around national security at the moment, cost of living as well. How did some of those issues rank last time? And are we expecting that to change? It's a real indication, David, of just how much the last two years has shifted the national conversation because cost of living was actually ranked 11th for Australians who responded uh, to Vote Compass back in 2019. So it's hard to believe that that would be, you know, placed at 11th spot for most Australians now, given what we know and what we've been speaking about tonight. The real pressures around cost of living, around petrol prices, the spiralling cost of housing, not only buying a house, but renting a house, of course, as well. So look, you don't have to be a political scientist to predict that that's probably going to be a little bit higher for people this year. But also uh, issues around security, including defence, uh, were ranked 13th. Now, really in the last decade, we haven't had a conversation like the one that we're having now around our security, about concerns around tensions with China, about concerns about the Pacific. So we know that um, many people will be keeping that front of mind when they go to vote this year. And it'll be really interesting to see the results of 2022 Vote Compass um, which will go live once we hear when the election is called. Well, uh, hopefully and probably not too much longer to wait. Bridget Brennan, that's going to be fascinating. Look forward to talking to you more about it in the coming weeks. Thank you. Now, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is going to cost around $34 billion next year. And according to the budget papers tonight, that will rise dramatically over the coming decade to more than $70 billion. The government has previously expressed concern about the ballooning cost of the scheme and it briefly tried to change the way assessments are done before dropping the idea amid a political backlash. Some NDIS participants, though, are worried that cuts are coming to the scheme because of this ballooning cost. Ellie Demarchelia has cerebral palsy and is the Senior Policy Officer at Women with Disabilities Australia. biggest pressure point on our family budget is definitely medical costs. Um, even though I have the NDIS and even though um, I have private health insurance, um, as a person with disability, I still um, have extreme medical costs, which were made even worse during the COVID um, period. I had um, previously been getting around um, in a wheelchair that I bought from a discount um, supermarket and um, I got this NDIS plan and for the first time I had a wheelchair that fit me. I had support workers to help me get ready in the morning and I was able to work and to contribute. And you know, it made me so proud to be part of this country that had invested the money into me and into all the other Australians with disability because they could see the potential um, in what we could give. Every time my NDIS supports a cut, it means that more pressure is put on um, whether we, you know, buy food this week or whether we take that medical appointment. Um, so really what keeps me up every night to be honest, is the idea that the NDIS won't exist anymore or that it will be cut further to the point that we won't recognise it anymore. 
Well, for more on what's in this budget for the care sector, particularly the NDIS, NDIS and aged care, I'm joined by Ian Yates from the Council on the Ageing and Bruce Bonahady, who is the architect of the NDIS. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Um, Bruce, let me come to you first. Now, those costs that we see laid out in the, in the budget tonight, they, sh they suggest more than doubling in the total cost of, of the NDIS. Is that going to be sustainable? Look, I, th I think the NDIS is definitely sustainable. Um, what we've seen, as you say, is a, is a significant increase in costs since the last budget. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that reflects a number of factors, uh, including increased prevalence of disability uh, and, and also a number of other factors that, you know, have, have contributed to these higher costs. But ultimately, you know, the NDIS has to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. People with disabilities, for people with disabilities and their families, it's essential, it's sustainable. Uh, and, but we also need to look at uh, not just the costs of the NDIS, but also the very significant benefits that it's providing, not just to people with disabilities, but to the Australian economy and the Australian well, it's a very good more point. broadly. It's because... a very good point. There's a, there's a big economic impact there. When you, when you do talk about ways to make it sustainable, I know you've been giving some thought to this, what, what are the answers? Well, I think there are a number of things that contrib contribute to the sustainability of the NDIS. One, one thing is we've got to get away from the sort of short-term cost-cutting we've seen and get back to the insurance principles, which mean that we seek to maximise uh, opportunity for people with disabilities while minimising uh, their lifetime costs. We also need to make sure that there's sufficient support for people not eligible for the NDIS, remembering that it currently covers about 500,000 people and there are another 2 million Australians under the age of 65 who have a disability. At the moment, the NDIS is an oasis in the desert. And it's not a surprise that more and more people want to seek entry to the scheme. So we need to make sure there's sufficient equitable support for those people not eligible for the NDIS, as well as making sure that the NDIS achieves the great vision that it has. Ian Yates, let me ask you about aged care. Uh, in tonight's budget, there's additional funding to train aged care workers, not to pay them any more. Will the training make a, a significant difference? Uh, there are a number of training initiatives and uh, they are important. They're, they're small in the 18.8 billion scheme of things. Uh, but the, the thing that's not so prominent in the, in the PR but is in the budget is the setting of a price for the new residential care funding instrument, the so-called Australian National Aged Care Classification. Uh, it replaces the current aged care funding instrument and that's a significant uplift in dollars per bed day and in exchange for that, providers are required to get to that 200 minutes um, of staff time. As recommended in the Royal Commission. As recommended by the Royal Commission. And we're saying although the package that was introduced last budget does have requirements for transparency in it, we've, seen, we've just seen this week the Minister call out providers who haven't used the extra money for food. Well, this is the point that uh, and we want to see third, accountability. Yeah, a third of aged care homes are still spending less than ten dollars a day per resident on meals. Ab absolutely, and I have regularly said, David, I'm sure to you, mm. that we have providers who are providing an excellent high level of service in this country for the same money, and others who aren't. And this, one of the things we have to do is fix that, or they get out. So when this extra funding comes in for residential care, transparency, real accountability, how have you spent the taxpayer dollar is going to be absolutely essential. In both of these areas, aged care and the NDIS, it's, it's clear that these costs are growing, going to have to be met. I want to ask you both, uh, there have been various recommendations from Royal Commissions and others about some form of levy, uh, an NDIS levy, an aged care levy, maybe you make it for both. Bruce, what do you think? Well, I, I don't think now's the time to be imposing a levy on Australians who are experiencing increased costs. You know, I think the NDIS can be funded perfectly well from general taxation revenues as well as the specific levy for which it now has access to. So I wouldn't be arguing for an, uh, a special Medicare, NDIS levy at this point, uh, particularly at this point in the cycle. What about you, Ian? Uh, look, I. I take the view that uh, a levy is just another tax instrument. Perhaps it's easier sometimes to sell. But what we really need is a government commitment to a high level of excellence in NDIS and in, and in aged care that's baked in. 
We don't have a levy uh, for the submarines. Uh, we don't need a levy to say that Australians put a high value on good residential and home care. And, and, and you know, in fairness, the government lifted the, the threshold substantially last budget and is continuing to add to it. So we need that to be sustained. The other measures that we've got, an independent pricing authority and so on, are going to mean governments are paying a lot more for aged care into the future. I think co-contributions in aged care, as opposed to NDIS, are going to become an issue. It is a little different between the two yes. sectors, but on that you're talking about those who can afford to pay more for aged care paying more. Absolutely. I think uh, you know it's going to be not sustainable going into the future to say that a retiree with a, a house worth several million and on a significant income has their aged care paid for by a young family struggling to get into the housing market and send kids, kids to school. Just to, yeah, and just a final one, workforce pressures uh, mm -hmm. in both sectors. Bruce, um, what's it like at the moment in the disability sector in terms of attracting the staff that are needed? Look, th there's a significant workforce issue. The government's had an opportunity from the beginning of the NDIS to uh, build a workforce, not just for disability, but for aged care and also for health services. And we desperately need um, better trained, better quality workers uh, as part of the NDIS. And of course, you know, COVID has exposed a lot of those shortages as um, workers have um, had to take time off because of co they had COVID or because family members have had COVID. So a work... A, a, a human services workforce strategy, I think, has to be developed, you know, across all three sectors. And Ian? Look, I, I certainly agree and pleased that Bruce has said that because if you just try and build your aged care workforce, NDIS pinch them and then the health service ups their wages and pinches all of them. So you need a care strategy, which is about better wages, better working conditions and career paths, um, and in many cases, better employers. But also, I think we face in the short term the need, and I know government's working on this, of a new immigration and visa program because our sector has relied quite heavily on uh, recent immigrants and visa holders. Ian Yates, Bruce Bonahady, thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you, David. Let's go back to Jeremy Fernandez in Newcastle with his pub test uh, this evening. Jeremy. Busy, thank you. I want to introduce you to Peggy, Soam and Suzanne, all of whom have got different views. They're, they're sort of um, aligned differently politically as well, so a good mix uh, from this local area in Newcastle. Peggy, you're a nurse. You really wanted to see spending on healthcare in particular, government yes. services. There was a fair bit announced today. How's that going down with you? Uh, there was not enough announced for healthcare. Look, we've been praised as healthcare heroes and working throughout the pandemic, and I think I saw some announcement on um, NDIS, which is fantastic. Um, an announcement of one drug on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. This was the breast cancer drug. Yes, which yep. is fantastic. The but PPE, uh, extra PPE. Extra as PPE. Well. Yep, that's correct. Um, which is fantastic. Like we've had such a shortage of PPE, it's so hard to find um, N95 masks, gowns, things like that, particularly when you need them. Um, but it, it's not enough. There, there was not enough of an announcement for a budget for healthcare. What, what did you expect in terms of just, you know, not just healthcare, but government services broadly? Oh, so government services, it's all around your public services. So that's your paramedics, your police, um, everything that people need. You, you need your public services for everything. Like, where, where are we going? We've got no announcement for your public services, really. Did anything else stick out in the budget to you in terms of things that you really liked or perhaps didn't quite meet your expectations? Oh, look, I saw it all pretty much as a bunch of glitter and a lot of ribbon cutting ceremonies. There was nothing that I think is going to benefit society in the future. There was nothing that was going to help our deep seated systemic issues. It was a lot of. So a bit, bit fluff. short term. Very short term, yeah. definitely. Now, Soam Chopra, uh, I need to welcome you back to Australia because Thank you're you. one of those uh, Australians who was stranded overseas 629 days but who's stuck counting, in Asia. <laughs> but who's counting? Who's and you made it back last December. Last December, December and I know, 3rd. And I know that whole thing about being locked out of Australia has really damaged your sense of this government's credibility, hasn't it? Well, I mean, the government, for me, has been reactive to the pandemic. And admittedly, at the start, well, no one, no one had dealt with a pandemic in the last 100 years. So I guess it was fair enough at the outset that they might be reactive to the pandemic. But as the pandemic unfolded, and it became quite clear that this was a, a major um, uh, event that was happening to the world, the government needed to do more. And that could be seen quite clearly by the, the uh, stroll out uh, of the vaccine. The vaccines weren't available when 
when they needed to be. And there was a lot of uh, uh, comment about the fact that uh, the government was too slow to order sufficient vaccines. And then there was a, a stroll out when it came to the boosters. Now, and I'll put the other argument to you that there was no playbook for any government anywhere, in, uh, anywhere in the world True. Um, to, to tackle the pandemic. That, you know, in terms of the cost of living pressures that we're seeing right now, the Treasurer, the Prime Minister repeatedly say we're doing better than people in the United States, the UK, in Germany. How does that sit with you as this economic um, kind of um, mission statement the government's laying out here? Well, I mean, I think, the, I think the economy was in a pretty good shape prior to the pandemic. I won't necessarily credit the government uh, uh, too greatly at having achieved that. Uh, and so we were well placed to deal with what unfolded. Uh, far better than other countries were, and that's how we've managed to keep the, the AAA credit rating and, and so on. Um, what have they done for me personally? There's a, there's a minor uh, pre-election cash splash type, yep. type uh, uh, budget really for me. Uh, there wasn't much in there. My notes say that, um, yeah, sure, look, the uh, reduction in the fuel excise will, yeah, will offer a little bit to, to particularly uh, working Australians who uh, need their cars, not so much for me. Um, Suzanne, can I bring Suzanne in here? Suzanne, um, your thoughts on how this has all gone down for you tonight and what you see in there for you, for your community? Yeah. Well, I think there's very um, little in it for me personally. I've been very fortunate. I've been retired now for 16 years, having worked for 40 years in Royal Newcastle Hospital as a physiotherapist. So I got a good superannuation handout and I'm also on a full pension, so I've done very well. well. We were talking about how you would have liked to have seen more support for business and industry in this region, the manufacturing sector, agriculture, yes. particularly post-pandemic. Yes. Definitely that. I mean, Newcastle was known for its manufacturing of uh, railway carriages, ferries, ships. Uh, one of the ships that used to go down to Antarctica re uh, regularly was, was built here. Uh, in Newcastle, but all that's gone now and no, no government uh, seems to be interested in bringing it back again. But you'll, just very quickly, you'll stay, keep your vote with the Liberal Party? Sorry? You'll keep your vote with the Liberal Party? Oh yes, election? yes I will, yep. I will indeed, yes. Okay. I've always voted Liberal. My father was a, a life member of the Labor yep. Party because he grew up with a single mum in Sydney in um, the 1930s. Yep. So he, uh, in those days, the Labor Party uh, did a lot of things for those people. Uh, but yes, uh, my family and I have always voted Liberal, yes. Suzanne Martin, Soam Chopra, Peggy Smith, thank you all so much for being with us. Thank you, Thanks. Jeremy, thank you. Jeremy, thank you. Now, uh, the Budget Week has a couple of big moments. One of them is Budget Night. Uh, I want to bring in Laura Tingle for a bit of breaking news because the other big moment in Budget Week, Laura, is the Budget Reply. That's right. What's happening? So, Anthony Albanese, as Leader of the Opposition, is supposed to give the Budget Reply uh, on Thursday night at uh, the same time, 7.30. Uh, Labor has just been told in the last little while uh, by the Prime Minister's office, apparently, that uh, the, they're, they're expecting uh, the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to address the Australian Parliament at 5.30 uh, on Thursday afternoon. Now, obviously, he's got a pretty limited schedule, but uh, it sort of uh, provides, a, shall we say, a bit of a spanner in the works to the build-up to the opposition leader's speech. Um, you know, creates a completely different dynamic, which will take uh, pr sort of attention away from the opposition leader's speech. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, well, you're right. They've been trying to line up this address to the Australian Parliament for some time. Uh, it, well, it, 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 it might take some of the, uh, the attention, as you say, away from the evening news and so on around the, the budget reply, where typically, and certainly with an election coming, this is a big opportunity for Anthony Albanese. That's right. So he might find himself a little bit less uh, oxygen on the night. Some breaking news. Laura Tingle, thank you very much for that. Well, the big business incentives that have run for the last two years of the pandemic are coming to an end. Tonight's budget, however, does offer some new incentives for small business. ABC News business reporter David Chow breaks down the key budget measures for business tonight. 
Businesses will receive a few benefits from this year's budget, which could reduce their taxes and encourage them to invest more. The first big ticket item is the technology investment boost. Basically, the government wants more businesses to upgrade their digital capabilities. So if you're a small business with annual turnover of less than $50 million, and you invest in, say, a portable payment device, cybersecurity system, or subscribe to some cloud-based software, you'll be able to deduct an extra 20% from what you spent investing in those items. This applies to tech expenditure of up to $100,000 in one year, and you have until 30th of June 2023 to claim it. It's estimated this measure will cost $1 billion over the next four years. Now, there's also the skills and investment boost to entice small businesses to upskill their staff. So once again, you need to run a small business with less than $50 million in annual turnover. If that applies to you, you can deduct an extra 20% off the cost that you incur on external training courses for your employees. The key word is external, so you can't claim tax deductions for in-house or on-the-job training. And it applies to money spent on training providers that are registered in Australia up to 30th of June 2024. It's expected this will cost the taxpayer $550 million over the next four years. Once again, there are incentives to hire apprentices this year, with the government committing an extra $1.3 billion until the middle of 2026. The government says this investment will be used to support apprentices in priority trades like carpentry. Finally, if you run a small and medium-sized business with less than $50 million worth of turnover each year, expect to pay a lower pay-as-you-go contribution just for the next financial year. The government estimates this will temporarily boost the cash flow of 2.3 million businesses, but at the end of the day, you'll still be paying the same amount of tax at the end of the year. With inflation expected to keep rising sharply, the government is hoping these tax and hiring incentives will ease pressure on businesses, boost productivity, and win themselves another term in office. David Chow there with the host of The Business. Kath Robinson joins me now. Kath, what's been the early reaction from business leaders to this budget? Well, David, you can't always please everyone, can you? The initial business reaction has been somewhat mixed. Uh, the investment in skills development and training has been broadly welcomed, as has the measures to lift industry and university collaboration. But one industry body, the AI Group, says it doesn't make headway into some of the structural barriers to further growth, and that includes taxation reform. And they also say they are still uh, disappointing levels of business investment. Now, we'll be speaking to the CEO of a core percent Sarah Derry. She says the budget will help the economy, people and households and is a good step forward. But, and there's always a but, uh, they're urging the government to do more for our cities to help them return to prosperity and to support the skills shortage. And we're also speaking to Australia's, I believe, only semiconductor maker Blue Glass uh, out of Sydney. Now, they're surprised that there was no high-tech industry building initiatives. And they say, as a result, Australia risks being left behind. So there are just some initial reactions. We'll also unpick some of the assumptions around those forecasts, particularly around debt repayments as well as wages growth. And we'll also have a look at whether the money was spent in the right places. All right, Kath, thanks so much. Looking forward to that. Well, it's no surprise. Cost of living is the main focus of this budget. Nearly every poll right now confirms rising prices are the number one concern of voters heading into the election. And the pinch is being felt the most in some of the battleground electorates, including the Tasmanian seat of Bass, the government's most marginal seat. Everything's just gone through the roof, hasn't it? Yeah, we've had to make decisions. We can't go out. We can't do family outings because we have to be more focused on the bills that need paying, fuel, everything. Basically, it's groceries in my case because of it's going up, but also fuel and uh, limited resources means you have to limit what you can actually get because it's, um, you know, it doesn't go as far as it used to. Well, with petrol prices and groceries going up because the state's run by trucks, it's very hard at the moment. All the prices are rising. Not too many noodles just yet, but yeah, having to sort of budget as much as we can yeah, on one salary. We have noticed the shopping has increased over the last few weeks. It's, it's, it's gone from, you know, you, you say you're 200 to, you know, 250, 300 sort of thing. If you, if, you know, when you're buying a full, doing a big weekly or fortnightly shop, it's, it's gone up. So, yeah. But you just have to do it, don't you? You've got to live, you've got to eat.
we're both age pensioners and we're struggling. We've got a cat and a dog. And just for us, we're finding it so hard to make ends meet from week to week. You know, it's just, everything's gone up and it's so hard to keep track of expenses these days. Oh, yes. A little bag of, of goodies here, $78. So, you know, probably three months ago, it would have been somewhat less than that. A lot less than that. Everything's gone up. Yeah, yeah, food's gone up. It's bloody ridiculous. Wages haven't gone up there. And I've just sort of uh, got retiring age too. <laughs> it makes it even worse. And I used to like the, the uh, parliamentarians and they're sending me silly, sillier than what I am. Well, that's how inflation's being felt in northern Tasmania. Let's look at what this budget will do to ease some of those cost of living concerns. I'm joined by Cassandra Goldie from the Peak Welfare Lobby Group, ACOS, St George Bank Chief Economist Bessa Detta and the ABC's Business Editor Ian Verinder. Good evening to all of you. Cass, let me start with you. The fuel excise uh, is being reduced for six months by 22 cents a litre. There, there's the $250 one-off payment for those on income support payments. And then after July, the $420 bonus for the low and middle income earners. Will this make a significant difference for those struggling with cost of living? Well, obviously, Dave, we got a budget that had a lot of temporary fixes in it, didn't we? Not really permanent solutions. I mean, the, the rent's got to keep being paid every week. Uh, those rents have gone up and they're not being turned around anytime soon. Um, and so we would have said for the, it's very expensive, that fuel excise measure. That's four billion that's going to cost roughly the I mean, bottom three, line. Yeah, three billion it nets out, I'd uh, say, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and so we would have focused on lifting up the incomes of people who are struggling the most. Um, and also we would not have done the tax offset plus an additional payment because, of course, that benefits people right up into six-digit salaries at the same time as we've got people on very low incomes, people on job seeker, $46 a day, uh, pensioners, nothing on Commonwealth for instance. So we didn't lift incomes in a way that was ongoing to make sure that people could have some confidence that they could rely on uh, being able to meet the basics. So your criticism is that the, that the fuel excise cut goes to everyone, even high income earners. You would have, instead no, of doing that, any that, fuel that, reduction, we, we know. put it into the, the unemployed. We do know right. that this is a very mixed picture in terms of what's happened to people's budgets over the last two years. The impact of the pandemic has hit people in very different ways, depending on whether you've had a lot of wealth and assets behind you, um, whether you've been a front line low paid worker, um, whether you've been you know struggling because you've been at the back of the employment queue. And we want to see helping people get into employment, but we will not do that if people are worried about being made homeless, and people are as we speak. And of course, going without food, we know that we've had a real crisis with terms of food relief. So we didn't get the permanent fixes we needed. And frankly, we didn't really deal with the big cost of living, which is housing. We might come back to that. Bessa Detta, um, we talk about housing, we talk about interest rates. There's been some debate already tonight about what these, you know, it's 8.6 billion in total that's going in these cost of living relief measures. What impact do you think that will have on the big decision on when to lift official interest rates? Well, certainly uh, the federal government did have a bit of a balancing act to strike tonight in that, you know, you've got an election looming large, you've got um, cost of living pressures, but at the same time, uh, by addressing those, they run the risk of elevating inflationary pressures even further. Um, I think uh, the cost of living uh, package uh, was reasonably targeted. Um, at the margin, it could possibly still lift the risk of inflation even further. Uh, interest rate markets have a rate hike fully priced in for June and have um, several rate hikes after that priced in for this year. We think there'll be three rate hikes this year, starting with August. And that's because you do have this backdrop of strong momentum in the economy, um, strong consumer spending and very low levels of unemployment. And in fact, that's what's helped deliver that wind f windfall mm. to the government's bottom but you're line. But you're not shifting from, because of tonight's budget, you're not bringing forward the point at which you think rates will rise. You're sticking with August? Yes, we're, we're, we're right. sticking with the view of August. But of course, there always is some risk that it could be earlier in June or July. And that'll depend on how the data evolves, particularly with wages data and particularly with consumer prices data. Ian, a lot of focus too, understandably, on when wages, are, real wages are going to grow. You grow wage growth out, out, outpacing prices. It's meant to happen next financial year. 
How credible do you think these forecasts are? Well, David, the problem with budgets always, and not just this one, is that uh, it all gets down to the assumptions that underlie these forecasts. And to be perfectly honest with you, both Treasury and the Reserve Bank for the past decade have gotten it horribly wrong when it comes to inflation and wage price growth. So, uh, you know, this time around, we're, we're forecasting that uh, inflation, it will in this budget, inflation will peak around about now at 4.25% and then miraculously drop away to 3%, and the year after that, 275 while wages growth will suddenly jump up next year at 3.25% where we get what's known as real wages growth because wages are outpacing inflation. But um, it's difficult to see how that could possibly happen. I mean, we've got inflation breaking out all around the world. It's true that the inflation problem we have here is largely to do with offshore factors and particularly being driven by fuel. But uh, we're now throwing another, you know, four, five, eight billion dollars into the into the economy within the next little while. And, you know, as uh, both Cassandra and Bess both indicated, you have the Reserve Bank wanting to, well, not wanting to raise rates too quickly, but you've got a lot of money now swishing around an economy that is still, you know, coping with the amount of uh, stimulus that was pumped in during the, uh, the, the pandemic. Just let me come back to you, Cass. I mean, you touched on housing earlier. This is a big uh, issue for um, those trying to get into the market, but those trying to pay rent uh, as well. There are some measures tonight to help with those trying to get a foot in the door. What would you have liked to have seen tonight? Well, we didn't get anything in the budget to deal with the affordability of renting. Um, we got these couple of measures extended, the you know first home uh, guarantee scheme and the super saver scheme. Both of those measures have been out there for a while. What they've done is they've helped to push up housing prices. They've exactly done the wrong thing in terms of the you know it, um, sort of impacts on the overall market. You'll have talked to many people who say, I thought I could afford to buy, and within two weeks, they've lost their access to being able to buy in. These are not the right measures. We keep saying do not do these kind of first home owner type schemes because they push prices up. It would be much better to put money into social housing for people who are struggling absolutely the most without being able to pay for the rent to keep a roof over their head, to fix the rental arrangements so that renting becomes a better long term option for people. We'll have Commonwealth rent assistance. That one hasn't been increased over for mm, about 20 years. That's now $70 a day. And for people on low incomes, pensioners and others, they are desperately worried they're going to lose their rental property and they'll be evicted into homelessness because there's no supply. Just quickly, Ian, let me get your thoughts on that. Do you think this home guarantee, homeowners guarantee scheme that is being expanded, has that had a material impact on pushing prices up in the market? All of these schemes push prices up, David. I mean, you just can't get away from that fact. I mean, politicians of all colours like to talk about affordable housing, but the only way you can get affordable housing is for prices to come down or for wages to go up. And, you know, nobody has really done anything about that in the past, well, 15 years or so. Mm. Housing prices have, have gone out of control. Uh, and really, you know, these kind of schemes do nothing more than add fuel to that fire. Well, Ian Verinder, Bessa Detta and Cassandra Goldie, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thanks. Well, let's, uh, for one last time, head back to Jeremy Fernandez in Newcastle. Jeremy, can I ask what's really jumped out in this budget for those you have been speaking with tonight? Uh, there's an interesting thing, um, I think, uh, Spearsy, where people who uh, vote a certain way uh, will have that frame how they respond to this budget. We've been taking this pub test, I've been calling it. Uh, we've invited uh, a range of voters here to the Great Northern Hotel in Newcastle to get their sense of what this budget means to them. Now, I want to introduce you to Miles Egan. Miles, you're a 22-year-old university student. You live in a coal mining community. How did you digest this budget? Um, to be honest, I'm concerned that enough still isn't being done to prepare coal mining communities like mine of Singleton for the future. Um, a lot of work has to be done both to um, get new jobs and industries in regions like the Hunter. A lot also has to go into the communicating with people in towns like Singleton about how transition happens. And until we sort of get a better understanding that mining is an identity and a culture for places like that. the Hunter. There's a lot of identity tied up with the way people transition away from yes. parts of the economy that have held them together for, for you know, exactly. centuries. Exactly. We're, we're not just asking people to transition away from a job. 
we're effectively asking people to transition from a way of life that has sustained communities for generations. And until we get a better appreciation of that from policymakers, I feel like we're going to have a real um, struggle to um, get um, support and have a successful transition in uh, places like the Hunter. Uh, Bob Hall from, Hall's from the uh, uh, CEO of uh, Business Hunter. In terms of tonight's budget, for those businesses that are still around, you know, whether it be coal or hydrogen or whatever, how do you think they will digest this budget tonight? Well, I think there's been a little bit in it for a lot, as it were. You know, there's some quite broad-based tax measures and investment measures that they've tried to cut across the entire economy. But it needs to be. There isn't a, a you know a, a single or a silver bullet solution to this. Um, everyone's on in the same page in terms of getting that consumer confidence back. And some of these issues are acute, particularly to regional Australia too, mm. which was mentioned a lot in the budget tonight. Wasn't it? Yes, exactly. You know, for a long time, the regions you know, you know, were the poor cousin. We often said that we missed out and uh, there's been an emphasis in there to try and get that regionalism back into the budget. And I think there needs to be that. And it'll be interesting to see what the, uh, the response is in terms of making sure that the regions that are crying out for assistance and those that have ambition like the Hunter um, are able to um, make use of the, the measures that were put in the budget tonight. Uh, Luke, for you, a couple more standouts from tonight. Oh, look, I mean, I'm personally very passionate about the environment. My businesses give a lot um, to, you know, biodiversity conservation. And I saw just briefly mentioned, Blink and you'll miss it, $170 million, the equivalent of six Mossman houses, I've sort of compared it to, is for the entire nations, uh, that's what we're putting towards. We've got the highest extinction rate in the world. I think there was a billion in there for the Great Barrier Reef as well. Yeah, but that's, uh, that's all climate change related. Like, I think climate change often ambushes the whole environment movement. We, we were making species extinct well before climate change was, um, like in this country in particular, well before climate change became the dominant issue. Um, that is really important, obviously. It's the, 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 it is the big environmental issue, but part of it, these are extinctions. They, they will never come back, these species. Um, and we're committing $170 million to it. So I, I just find that not enough. Uh, Bob, uh, we're going to hear the budget reply from Labor in the next couple of days. Just very quickly, your thoughts on what you expect from Labor? Well, the challenge for them will still be to get a, a, a combination across a lot, lot of touch points because there's not one section of the economy that you can say is doing spectacularly well to others. And there's a lot of ambition being written into the programs of what we're trying to see ahead for the nation over the next five, 10 years, particularly in energy. Um, so, yeah, there's some challenges there to make sure that it is comprehensive and it is universal enough that, that everyone gets a drink out of this so we do get that confident, consumer confidence back, business confidence back, and we can start firing again. All right. Uh, final thoughts from Soam Chopra, uh, who's recently returned to Australia. You're traditionally a Labor voter. I think you're going to be voting uh, Labor again. I, I see, um, I your thoughts on tonight's budget? Well, it's, it's obviously a cash splash type uh, pre-election budget. Uh, not much in it really for anybody. The devil will be in the detail. Uh, I imagine that uh, the opposition leader will come out with similar kinds of things on, on, on Thursday. Uh, there was uh, the, the Treasurer said net zero by 2050, but where's the disaster mitigation strategies? We're just experiencing floods again in northern New South Wales. He said that we will deliver, but he should have delivered. Linda, from you? Uh, I think one of the, the disappointing things was, you know, science got us through this epidemic and, you know, the basic research that years and years of basic research that led to the development of these micro RNA vaccines. Where's the funding for that? We're funding innovation, but where's the funding for all of the research that goes before that innovation? Linda, so Miles, Bob, Luke, thank you all so much for being with us here tonight. Really appreciate it. Lots of these conversations yet to come, Spearsy, as we head towards the federal election campaign. Jeremy, thank you. Terrific stuff. Sounds like there'll probably be continued debate there uh, this evening, well into the night. Look, thanks very much for your company tonight as well. Anthony Albanese will deliver his budget reply on Thursday night. He joins Lee Sales straight after that, and I'll be back with a special Budget Week edition of Q&A live from Canberra following all of that on Thursday night. Hope you can join us then. Stay with us now for Kath Robinson and the Business Budget Special. Welcome to the Business Budget Special. I'm Catherine Robinson.
The Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, has handed down his fourth budget with what he says is a plan for a strong economy and a stronger future. There are cash splashes to ease cost of living pressures, along with funding for training, apprenticeships and tax incentives for small businesses. But experts are questioning if the money being spent will lead to productivity gains and wages growth, and if it's prudent to continue racking up debt in an environment of rising interest rates. The the bottom line has improved since December thanks to a booming resources sector and a falling unemployment rate which is forecast to reach its lowest level in half a century. Economic growth is tipped to spike this financial year before moderating over the next four years and debt is forecast to keep soaring over that same period. We'll speak to the Finance Minister shortly but first this report from Nassim Hadem on the effect of those tax breaks and cash handouts on the economy. Like many Australians, Akriti Chetri is struggling to pay the bills. The 23-year-old works in aged care and says her wages aren't keeping up with consumer prices. I've noticed the cost of living has gone up and for me personally it's more um, doing groceries, filling my car up. Akriti is one of more than 10 million people who will receive an extra $420 when she files her tax return from July, as the low to middle income tax offset increases to $1,500 this financial year. But she will face a tax hike when the offset ends in 2023. I definitely don't think that's fair, especially for people in those lower income percentile. To further ease the cost of living, pensioners and people on welfare will get a one-off cash bonus of $250 and the fuel excise will be cut in half for six months, saving Australians on average $350. That measure will also help businesses like 3D printing startup Titomic, which has seen the cost of transport rise. A reduction on these costs is definitely positive on that side. There's $1.3 billion to support employers to engage and retain new apprentices. Also, for every $100 a small business spends on training their employees, they will get a $120 tax deduction. If businesses invest up to $100,000 on digital technology, they can claim back 120% at tax time. At the end of the day, having less taxes uh, to be paid in any uh, form is always great. The Treasurer hopes that the measures in the budget will help Australians better cope with the rising cost of living. But he's also had to weigh up the risk that too much spending will lift inflation and force the Reserve Bank to raise interest rates sooner than expected. The $17 billion in additional spend will clearly add to inflationary pressures and that increases the probability that the Reserve Bank will need to move earlier on rate rises. The Grattan Institute's Daniel Wood says the cost of living cash splash is an election sweetener. My major criticism is, is really that it's not um, setting us up for the, the long term. Australians will soon have to decide whether the extra money will change their vote. Nassim Hadem reporting there and I was joined by Finance Minister Senator Birmingham earlier. Senator Birmingham, welcome to the business. Hi, Gath. Great to be with you. Now, the government is spending around $8.9 billion in these cost of living measures, the cash payouts, the tax offset and the cut to the fuel excise. Would this money have been better spent in areas that contribute more greatly to productivity, areas which would structurally change our economy to make us more competitive? Kath, we are investing billions of dollars in skills, making sure that businesses are encouraged to take on more apprentices and that the support is there uh, to drive that transformation in the skills of Australians. We're investing in helping small businesses, particularly to upskill their workforce, but also to invest in digital technologies that make them more productive, competitive for the future. We've got a $120 billion infrastructure pipeline uh, that is rich in areas that are seeking to lift productivity across the economy. So there's a range of productivity enhancing parts in this budget, but it is also appropriate to recognise for reasons of consumer confidence and otherwise that households are doing it tough right now uh, and that with the dividend of strong economy, we're able to 
make deficits lower and debt lower than it would have been in the mm. future and invest elsewhere in business, that we also help those households out with their rising costs. If I can maybe just uh, speak to you about the fuel excise. We know that it costs about $3 billion after the rebates. I mean, could that money have been better spent, say, on rolling out EV infrastructure, which would leave Australians less reliant on the oil price and the petrol bowser in years to come? Well, again, we are rolling out electric vehicle infrastructure. We're doing that uh, through work of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, ARENA, uh, and support there in that sector. Uh, but this is about recognising problems that people face right here, right now. The oil price spikes, thanks to Russia's war on Ukraine, are real. They're spikes that are forecast to come down over time, but it's hurting Australians and hurting households. And with that, we know comes real pain that also would have flow through implications for consumer confidence or the like if we didn't act. So it's why we're acting to make sure we respond in a temporary, targeted and responsible manner to give people the help now while it's hurting, recognising that those broader issues we're equally addressing. So do you expect these cash payouts and the tax cuts to be spent or are you concerned that if like during the pandemic the payments are saved or put onto the mortgage or tucked under the mattress because then that won't be a consumer-led recovery with respect to growth but if indeed they do spend that money it could have inflationary impacts on the economy which would lead to rate rises and therefore crimp growth. So are you in a bit of a tricky position? Well, Kat's dealing with those two aspects. One, in terms of the inflationary element. Uh, we've taken careful advice around structuring this, and just as higher petrol prices add directly to the impact of inflation, this action, which will see 22 cents a litre come off the price of petrol, will actually decrease inflationary pressures. In terms of spending, for many households, they don't have a choice uh, but to buy petrol and meet the higher costs of living, uh, to get to work, to get the kids to school, uh, to do the shopping, uh, to go to weekend sport, all of those other pressures. So uh, yes, we expect many uh, Australians need this money right now, uh, but for some they may choose uh, to save it for a different rainy day. And uh, that has worked well during COVID, where again, we kept our measures in response to COVID temporary and targeted. And that's precisely what we're doing here in responding to these shocks from the Ukraine and other global events. If we can just briefly talk about the debt repayments um, with the deficit. Gross debt as a share of the economy is forecast to peak at around 44.9% of GDP in 2025. What are the assumptions uh, behind that with respect to borrowing costs? Uh, so what we've recognised there in terms of borrowing costs is, uh, is a mild increase. Uh, we have managed to lock in uh, long-term low interest rates for, uh, for borrowing costs, uh, but we take the expert advice there and reflect that in terms of uh, the future projections. Importantly though, debt is lower than previously forecast, peaking earlier than previously forecast. Uh, we have more than halved the future projections of deficit budgets uh, and we've been able to do that because with the stronger economy, with higher levels of employment, uh, we have been banking the vast majority of the dividend from that uh, mm. against achieving lower deficits into the future. Just finally, Senator, I know that you, you say that you take this expert advice, but I noticed in my email that was an assumed 10-year bond yield of 1.8%. It's now almost 3%. The budget assumes a nominal uh, borrowing rate of 2.3%, as I just said, but the 10-year Treasury yield is at about 3%. So isn't this going to make debt repayments a lot harder? And doesn't it expose Australia then to vulnerabilities of external shocks? That, Kath, is, uh, is why the vast majority of the extra benefit we've, uh, we've achieved in terms of higher revenue uh, and therefore a windfall gain to government we have banked as savings into the budget bottom line. So we have ensured uh, that we are reducing deficits faster than was going to be the case. Uh, and we've taken the vast majority uh, of that extra revenue out into the forward estimates years to do that. They're still conservative projections because we still assume that commodity prices will come down over a six month trajectory. Uh, and there is a significant upside that could be achieved if those commodity prices stay higher for longer. Uh, but this is about making sure we maintain the AAA credit rating uh, with which Australia is one of only nine countries in the world to have that from all three major international ratings agencies. Senator Birmingham, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Kath. My pleasure.
Well, joining me in the studio is senior economist and partner at KPMG, Sarah Hunter. Great to see you, Sarah. And independent economist and climate counsellor, Nikki Hartley. Always nice to speak with you, Nikki. We spent the day together in, in lockup, uh, but I'd love it if you could just share your initial impressions and take out of the budget. Yeah, I think it's a hard one, Kath, because clearly we can see, you know, debt deficit coming down, that they've locked in, as you know, Simon Birmingham said, the, the windfall that they got. But in amongst all the measures, you know, the government is painting, or the Treasurer is painting this lovely picture of a great economic future with hubs here and innovation here. But there's a lot of substance that's missing from some of the policy announcements. So there's some giveaways, as you'd expect, before an election budget, the sweetness to individuals, some nice things for, for small businesses, um, which will be good for you know skills and for, for digital investment. But overall, is there anything in here that sees Australia a markedly different country than it was before COVID? I don't think so. And we had very sluggish growth before then. And what I worry about in this budget is that it's not giving us something that's going to, that idea of building back better mm. from COVID. I don't see really hard, tangible things in here. They're going to change our future. And of course, for me, nothing on climate change is mm. a real negative. Which we can get to. Sarah, what are your initial thoughts? I mean, it is always very difficult to please everyone, isn't it? It is. And it is clearly a cost of living budget. That all of those sort of windfalls and that extra strong revenue growth we've had from the economic recovery that thus far, most of that in the near term has gone into um, those measures around uh, the uh, sorry the uh, uh, the, the, the meter the tax uh -huh. office that's the one and um, the fuel uh, duty and um, the one-off payments mm -hmm. um, and so that I mean that's that's helpful but I do have concerns around how much of that given that we're operating close to full employment already is actually going to come through in inflation as opposed to extra outputs mm -hmm. um, my other concern around it is um, to pick up on Nikki's point uh, around productivity growth in the long run so that medium-term trajectory of getting back to a sort of low sustainable level for the deficits just to touch on the one percent of GDP in mm. the early 2030s that's predicated on productivity growth of one and a half percent that's pretty strong if you look in the historical record we've not mm. achieved that for quite some time mm. and there, as I agree there wasn't much in the budget there to say how that would actually be achieved and that's a challenge I think for the next government whoever that would be. Well that's an interesting point isn't it because when you drill down into some of those forecasts Nikki you've got wage price growth to be increasing out to 25 26 to three and a half percent but you've got inflation coming down you've got unemployment ticking up and you've got real GDP flatlining at two and a half percent so where are these assumptions coming from particularly with the wage price index yeah I mean that really strong unemployment and um, that we've got at the moment is not something that necessarily can be sustained without having expansionary policy for for a long period of time we just this doesn't appear to be the momentum to keep it going so I think there are some some risks in those budget forecasts but particularly around I mean wages growth the treasurer is saying we're going to get that strong wages growth because unemployment is going to get down to 3.75 percent which is above the, that key level that economists look for but that's a market driven wage rate, it's not genuine sort of productivity enhancing wages growth, which you know, Jennifer Westacott was saying earlier from the Business Council, that's the solid thing that we need to see to make sure we don't build up inflationary pressures. What you don't want to do is get into empty wage growth that just chases inflation, that chases wages, and we get back to where we were in the, you know, in the 80s and you end up with stagflation. So mm. there's some risks in those mm. numbers. Uh, Sarah, just uh, in just 30 seconds or so, I mean, where do you see the issues with, with wages growth? Where is it going to come from? Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. It's the real wages growth piece is the challenge that nominal wages growth catching up with inflation I think that's a reasonable expectation and a lot of inflation it is temporary in as much as if we think of commodity prices the pace of fuel price rises right now we're not going to sustain that we're not going to keep going at 40 percent a year so it's reasonable to expect the pace of inflation will come off and wages nominally will catch up but real wages is what we want and that does as Nikki says rely on productivity growth mm. and that for me is the missing piece of the puzzle. Okay well as we have been discussing cost of living relief has been a key focus of this budget but will these measures fuel inflation and force businesses to pass on higher costs. Let's go live to Brisbane where Rachel Papazzoni is talking to business leaders about what they think these announcements will mean for their companies and the wider economy. Rachel. Thanks, Kath. And let's continue that conversation about wages and jobs. Joining me is the CEO and founder of Plot Logic, Andrew Job, as well as the CEO of Accor Pacific, Sarah Derry. Andrew, I'll start with you. Obviously, cost of living and rising inflation is a big theme with this budget. Was there anything in there that will address your rising input costs? 
I think uh, there's some good incentive there in terms of the, um, the, the, the additional tax incentive for uh, technology and training. Um, we didn't see a big value for us in the diesel, sorry, in the fuel excise generally, uh, but overall we sort of felt that it's, it's not a bad budget but not a great budget in terms of our input costs. Sarah, your business is obviously in a space that is more focused on discretionary spending. Uh, is the, I guess, the one-off payments that many Australians will receive, is that good news for a business like yours? I think it is a positive initiative from the government. What it means is that um, households and families will have more discretionary spending, as you said, and every time the borders have opened and people have been able to travel in the last two years, they've absolutely done that. People want experiences, people want to get together with friends and family, and I think it will allow them to do that. And as we look to Easter and the school holidays, we are seeing people wanting to come together. So I, I do think that's a good initiative that will drive that forward. I'd like to see more for the long term as well. Households will obviously get that, that bonus payment. Inflation continues to rise though. Is a business like yours going to pass on those rising costs to your customers? Well, what we're going to see is that um, expenditure you know, will increase slightly, which will be good. Um, we will certainly see that um, with costs increasing, they will have to be passed on to consumers in some way, but we'll certainly be doing our very best to provide great experiences for people when we, when we have them staying in our hotels and our businesses. Andrew, your company is one that's doubled its workforce in the last year and plans to double again uh, throughout this year. There's a lot of pressure on businesses to increase wages to reward staff. Is there an obligation for companies like yours to be paying more when we're talking so much about wage increase but just not seeing it really? I think there's a couple of parts to that. As a startup business, the changes to the employee share scheme is really positive for us. Um, it's, we want to attract people that uh, invested in our business and our vision and to have a share scheme that actually allows them to participate in the opportunity is really positive. Um, in terms of our you know, thinking going forward, we're seeing a lot of pressure on wages and so we're trying to get on the front foot with that and, and really incentivise our staff to stay. And it's something that I feel you know, as a business owner and a business leader, we need to take responsibility for that ourselves rather than waiting for the government to do the heavy lifting. Over 600,000 people are employed in the tourism sector in Australia, Sarah. Can those workers expect to see their wages increase? I think we're already seeing pressure because we are experiencing a skill shortage already and so it is a competitive market. What we do need to see is we need to see a return of international workers and that's really important for our industry as well as many other industries. So I think what we've seen from the government tonight with some of the initiatives around apprentices and extending the funding to that, for that is really important for our industry and many others, as well as pre-employment programs. So I think that they will bring new people into our industry, but most importantly what we need to see is people coming back internationally working in our businesses. That's really needed. Andrew, you work in the tech space, sort of servicing the, the mining sector, so I guess sort of covering two mm. sectors there. What did the budget miss that you would have liked to have seen? I see that you know, the future of Australia is really dependent on a very high innovation economy. Uh, for us, you know, we, we have some great natural strengths in Australia in terms of natural resources um, as well as innovation. And you know, there's an opportunity to set ourselves up for the next three to ten years with more thinking around how we actually drive innovation in the economy um, at all levels. And so we've seen some you know, movement in terms of additional funding for main sequence, uh, the venture capital fund of, of uh, CSIRO. Uh, we've seen some additional funding in terms of uh, incentivising research and industry collaboration to drive innovation. And we've seen the improvement in the patent box scheme, which we also think is a really positive move. But we see that as really just a starting point to, to some structural changes that need to occur to drive innovation over the next decade. Sarah, we're in Queensland, which has been a, a particularly populous um, state for, for tourism from pe yes. people within the country. Obviously now with the borders open, uh, you know, the hope is no doubt from your point of view that there'll be more international tourists. Was there anything in the budget you, that you think will encourage that? There certainly is. I think what we've seen from the government is an initiative around um, 
tourism, marketing, and that's getting the message out that international visitors to come back to Australia, come back fast, visit this beautiful country, whether it's the Great Barrier Reef, get to our cities and things like that. So that's been really important. There's certainly some focus on far north Queensland and certainly regional parts of Australia. What I do think that we would like to see more of is more of a focus on the cities. We also need to make sure that those cities come back to life. We need festivals, we need events, we need corporates travelling, and that's important. But certainly Queensland has been the destination of choice. And I would say that what we need to see from the government is that continued level of consistency, and that's around regulations, open borders, because when we've got consistency, consumers have confidence, and then sentiment increases. And I think that's good for the whole economy. Mm. And I, I tend to agree with that in terms of, from a general industry point of view, it's uh, really difficult for, for a business where you're working across lots of different state borders to have some consistency of understanding of how you can interact with your clients. Mm. So anything we can Sorry, do... I'll to... have to stop you there. Andrew, Job and Sarah Derry, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you. Kath, it's back to you in the studio. Thank you very much, Rachel Papazoni, coming to us from Brisbane there. Sarah, when you look at this in a, in a holistic perspective with the spending, do you think that there is enough in there for business? Well, there's quite a bit in there for small businesses around uh, incentives for the digital investment, um, for training that's on the job. There's also the broader package around apprenticeships and skills and training more generally, and quite a lot of spending on cyber, cyber security, spills into defence and infrastructure, um, and the inevitable increases in infrastructure and healthcare. So if you're for businesses exposed to those sectors, then mm -hmm. there is the general good news, but it is pretty limited, mm -hmm. generally speaking, mm -hmm. particularly for larger businesses. Mm -hmm. Nikki, what was missing for business? Well, clearly anything on climate change. I mean, the expenditure is so low, less than half a percent of total expenditures go on climate, and that's on previously announced initiatives. And yet we've got, you know, the energy minister talking up gas and oil. And unfortunately for businesses, climate is a huge risk. If you talk about cyber security, you also need to be talking about what are you doing to help businesses to pre prepare more mm. for the transition for climate risks. We're going through dreadful floods still at the moment. Mm. You know, we need to have more in there. We saw billions for disaster to recovery from these floods, but nothing about mitigation, only a little about adaptation. You know, they've really fallen short. And this is something businesses need to be prepared for. We see the supply disruptions all around us. Well, some businesses are feeling left out of this budget for other reasons, with no significant announcement for high-tech manufacturing. Let's get more on this now and head to Western Sydney, where Alicia Barry is at Australia's only listed semiconductor maker. Alicia, what's the reaction been there? Well, Kath, I'm inside the facility that makes semiconductor laser diodes. Now, these are used in things like quantum computing and high-tech manufacturing. Blue Glass has this facility here in Silverwater, and it also has one in Silicon Valley, where, of course, the industry is thriving. That's not quite the case here. Joining me now is Executive Chair James Walker. James, you and I watched the budget together and I noticed you didn't take down too many notes. No, that's right. And I didn't take down too many notes because I didn't hear anything tonight from the government that was a direct incentive to help create a high-tech manufacturing industry in Australia. There were a lot of short-term incentives, particularly for consumers and small to medium businesses. Would you have liked to have seen something more long-term? No, I think that's absolutely right. So if you look at the last two years, the supply chain constraints that we've all faced um, that's a result of not having a direct manufacturing, manufacturing industry here in Australia. Um, so I would have liked to have seen something that helped foster that. New South Wales government is doing exactly that in the semiconductor industry. They've got a long-term plan to build a semiconductor industry here in New South Wales. And it would have been great to have seen something from the government to help support that. And one of the issues you've pointed out to me is the trouble you have in attracting highly skilled staff. If the industry, industry was thriving here, perhaps that would make it easier. Is that something the government could have addressed tonight? Well, I think so, but it comes back to the industry, right? So we just acquired a manufacturing facility in Silicon Valley purely for one of the reasons was about attracting talent. The talent exists over in there and it doesn't exist yet in Australia. So to build an industry in here would have been, um, would help solve the employment issues. And what's your general takeaway, do you think, from the budget tonight? Um, well, a lot of short-term incentives for sure. Um, and I don't think from an industry and business point of view, a lot of long-term planning. And would you say you felt disappointed or surprised? Um, probably not disappointed and probably not surprised, to be honest. I mean, we've got an election a couple of weeks away. Um, and the budget was clearly based for the election coming up.
Okay, so a muted response then from you, James Walker. Thank you so much for your time. And I suppose that is a muted response, Kath, because there was probably a little bit more expected from the semiconductor maker Blue Glass, given the supply uh, chain constraints that mm. we did see throughout the pandemic. Mm, we've been reporting on them for quite some time, and it's a problem that's probably not going anywhere anytime soon. Alicia, thank you. Uh, Nikki, we just heard there from um, the managing director there, James from Blue Glass, saying that uh, he's a manufacturer. He directly leads into productivity for the economy. Uh, but we did have a modern manufacturing strategy that was announced in the budget. Does that go nowhere towards these businesses? Well, I think that's part of the problem is these, these you know, fancy ideas that we have, but what does it actually mean? What is the government doing with this? The, the modern manufacturing strategy, in fact, has been previously announced. There was a little bit more funding in here, but it's not clear initiative. It's not clear who it's going to. Um, you know, we can say we're going to have critical minerals manufacturing up in the Northern Territory or the Pilbara, but, you know, who is going to do this? If they're not doing it now, why are they not doing it? And who is the government talking to? There's, there's, there's these dreamy ideas about things that would be great, but there's no substance behind what it is that they're doing to really significantly transform Australia. And that would be something that would include having much more competitive um, wage environment versus, you know, many parts of Asia. Um, you know, some of these things, transport costs, um, all of these things that, that we don't have natural competitive advantages. So I think, you know, look, it's good that there are companies that actually are able to be competitive and manufacture in Australia, but they're few and far between. And there's, there's a good reason for that. And it would take some very significant reforms right across the economy, um, not just some, you know, budget time announcements and I think it's part of the problem with the budget for me is that we expect it to be this almost miracle economic statement um, that's that's going to give us new new policies but really it's an accounting statement of where we've got to and we sort of throw a bit of this in and a bit of that in there's a whole load of politics mm. in the mix and it doesn't it doesn't quite deliver at the end of the day I think maybe we need to rethink our, how we do budgets mm. and policy. Sarah, you touched on the idea of productivity and what this budget does mm. for productivity earlier in, in the program. I mean, where does it leave us with respect to productivity, which we know has been at almost nothing for the last five years when you look at national accounts? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, as Nikki said, there's a limited amount in the budget that, that plays to productivity in terms of tangible, solid policies. And I think that uh, w whichever the next government is, that's something that they'll need to be tackling. And indeed, we've got the Pro Productivity Commission going through their five-year exercise at the moment, and we've been contributing to that. And it'll be interesting to see what comes out in terms of their recommendations and what gets adopted ultimately. Um, the only other thing I mentioned around the budget that it was very positive to see actually was the steps around paid parental leave mm. and about bringing forward the childcare subsidy. This is really uh, good news for working families, particularly for working women who generally take on the, the burden of childcare and, and will often reduce their work to and, and as work we know, around if, that. If women can get back into the yes, workforce, exactly. that leads directly to... Productivity. productivity and they've got all these skills and attributes that they can offer to employers but if there are these barriers to uh, to going back to work then you lose that so that was a positive but it you know there's more to do in that space mm. and there's more to do in many other spaces Much more to as do well in that space to get more men mm. Nikki Nikki Hartley and Sarah Hunter it's been great speaking with you thank you for joining us uh, on budget night thanks Kev. And that is all on this budget special from the business. For more on those stories, head to the ABC News website and click on the business page and you can catch the program anytime on iView. And join us tomorrow night at 8.45 on the News Channel and after the late news on ABC TV for more business reaction to the federal budget. I'm Catherine Robinson. Thanks for your company. See you next time. ABC TV Plus brings you constant.